seeing the presence of a quorum, uh, I'll call this meeting of the Amherst Pollen Regional School Committee at 6.30 p.m. Wow, we're on time. And seeing the presence of a quorum, I'll call this meeting of Union 26 to order also at 6.30. Okay, and uh, in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 38, Purpose 2, um, which uh, describes the need to conduct negotiations with non-union personnel in executive session, if it would be detrimental to do so in public session, I uh, hereby move that the Regional School Committee enter into executive session. Is there a second? Second. second. It's been moved and seconded by Ms. McDonald. Uh, it requires a roll call vote. We'll begin down here. Menino, aye. Jean-Louis, aye. Demling, aye. McDonald, aye. Akajim, aye. Ordonez, aye. Kastensen, aye. Okay. We, the Regional School Committee is in executive session. Yeah, you'd say, you'd say oh, yes. I'm not in regional. Union 26. Oh, so, okay, call I. Sorry. The regional school committee did, but Union 26 has to go in now. Okay. Hence why I was not well looking forward to the interruption. Are you back on? I am. Thank you very much. Mr. Demlin? Okay, and so uh, I will move for Union 26 to enter executive session in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Purpose 2, to conduct negotiations with non-union personnel, Sean Mangano. Okay, uh, and so roll call vote, uh, starting on the end. Menino, I. Jean-Louis, I. Demling, I. McDonald, I. Ordonez, I. Hall, I. All right, we're in executive session. Great, thanks. And you're able to shut it off? Yep. We're, we are back. Uh, Superintendent, would you like to introduce the item? Sure. <coughs> Jody, you're all, you're good? Yep, we're uh, Okay. Awesome. So, um, yeah, so we're coming back to this item that was discussed uh, at a prior meeting of the same two bodies. And there were some changes. Uh, one, one that I want to really highlight from the prior discussion, um, the topic was around establishing an agreement with the school superintendent and the town manager to utilize the school finance director to develop options and make recommendations for financing town and school capital projects. And we talked last time about how that might work. And <coughs> one of the feedback that we received um, is on the last page of the memo. Um, and the most significant change is um, on that back page, and I appreciate the town manager for engaging w with myself and, and um, hearing that feedback. Right above the paragraph where it says conclusion, uh, the change is the proposal will be implemented as a pilot that will terminate on October 1st, 2019 unless otherwise extended by agreement of the Town Manager, Superintendent of Schools, Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee, and Union 26 School Committee. So the prior version that you looked at had um, sort of a tentative uh, end date, but it was, it was loose, and it was sort of like one could read the, read the memo as that it would sort of continue unless someone wanted to end it, and this has the actual opposite arrangement, that it has a defined end date, and if there is a continuation, if this is a relationship between the committees and the town of Amherst that's working effectively, that we would want to have re-engaged conversation about how to move forward. Um, so I think one of the things that, that I think I feel more comfortable with, uh, and you know, I don't want to speak for the town manager, but I think we're in agreement, is that we want to actually have a time-defined end date, uh, and if things are going so swimmingly, uh, to actually reopen how this might look in the future, to not make a, you know, what, what it might end up feeling like a long-term arrangement now, but to see how this goes and to actively re-engage instead of passively uh, if this is something that we want to continue into the future. So that's the, the most significant change, really the only um, meaningful change in the memo from the last meeting to the current meeting. Terrific. I don't know if the town manager has anything <coughs> that he wants to add or not. Thank you for taking this up. But I think that change that you suggested at the last meeting actually is better from my perspective, I think from the district's perspective, uh, because it, um, it clarifies for the employee also that this may not be an ongoing relationship. So I think that it has a lot of positive outcomes and it doesn't, it, it really creates the clarification that you were seeking. So I thank you for Great. suggesting that. Thank you. Mr. Mangana, give it your you don't have to have anything, so I'm just, okay. <laughs> Figured I'd give it, give it a shot at. So for the committees, Mr. Demling. Uh, so would this take effect immediately? I think it would. Um, I think, you know, for our vantage point, we've been having conversations with the town about this for quite some time. Uh, I think from, I don't want to, again, trying to be cautious, but I think I can say confidently from the town's perspective that um, 
there's some time urgency to figuring out if this model is going to work. If not, then there's going to be after very quick plan B, given where we are in capital planning for the town of Amherst on their end. And from our end, I think if we're going to start it, this feels like the appropriate time um, to get mm -hmm. going. Uh, I think the longer we go without starting it, the less effective kind of the relationship would be. Um, and, and I'd be concerned about the catch-up time that Mr. Mangano would have to spend picking up midstream of a capital process for the town and how that would impact <coughs> his work in the, for the regional schools and for the year 26. Okay. Other questions or comments? I just want to um, share my appreciation uh, to the superintendent and to the town manager for, uh, and to Mr. Mangano, of course, for um, considering an, you know, an end date um, to this. I think it actually feels more doable, uh, knowing that we can come back and have another conversation at mm -hmm. some point, and it's not uh, just sort of a you know, pre-ordained uh, conclusion. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that change. I did just want to quick, quickly check in with Sean again to make sure that given the updates to the, to the contract, he still felt like it was a positive, uh, uh, a thing that he was looking forward to is something positive for himself and the district, districts. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, I think, I think exactly what Paul said, was, which is it creates a defined term, um, so it's sort of like a specific project, and then we can come back to it. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I agree and approve. Right. Right, and I, and I, I appreciate the extra work that you put in to clarify both the, the agreement um, as well as, honestly, the financial arrangements in which, I mean, everything you do is precedent. And um, regard, regardless of how swimmingly this will go, um, you're always concerned if you're opening up uh, a, a special policy or a special approach to contracting and remuneration particularly being, being member towns of a regional district that are all equal uh, and of multiple districts. And so it, it, it's challenging, but I think the solution you came up with, with is neat. Um, I guess one question I have is, is what, what do we, what are, I'm trying to remember what we talked through or what we need to talk through in terms of the vote, in terms of the terms of the agreement. Yeah. Yeah, I think I should share them publicly before the. That's what I, that's what I was thinking yeah. too. Sure. So the terms of the agreement are that um, to line up things financially and to make sure it's fair for the multiple districts as well as for the town of Amherst, um, we're estimating that it would, this uh, transition would be, f or this um, transfer would be 15% of Mr. Mangano's time. And uh, what we tried to do is net that, what we did is net that out uh, as an equation. So we looked at that financial implication. Uh, on the other side, to make sure it netted out, would be 20% of the town procurement officer. Uh, his role, um, we are applying for many capital funds in all of our communities, and that's going to be a huge help to the business office. Um, I think it's fair to say it's not Mr. Mangano's favorite task, is procurement. Um, it takes a lot of time, and it's not, I think, uh, consistent with the leadership that Mr. Mangano is able to offer. It's not the best use of his time. Uh, and the town procurement officer happens to be very good at that. Um, those two numbers don't equal out, so it also would net a payment on an annualized basis of roughly $6,000 to the districts um, to make sure that there's an equal um, financial arrangement between, arrangement between the districts and the town of Amherst. And um, for me, you know, it was, it's defensible if, it, if, it, if I ever got questioned on it. It really comes out even, Stephen, and I think it really needs to, and I appreciate the perspective of, of um, precedent setting, that we want to work collectively and collaborative with all of our member towns, and we want to need to do that fairly to make sure the balance between our towns, um, any of the towns, is kept uh, live and active and, and feels fair. So I really, I really appreciate you going over that, because that, to me that's, in the end, one of the most critical, I mean, obviously, how this works, um, both in terms of the, the, the pr end product for the town of Amherst and the end product for the districts, but also in, in the day-to-day -day working relationship that obviously, I think the, the concern expressed by every member of the committee pretty much at some point about hoping that, um, I'm looking at you, Mr. Mangano, you're happy and you have like, I mean, you're gonna be worked very hard. Um, so I guess I mean happy in the context of working very hard and productively, um, but we wanted that to work out. But frankly, in that context, we're also concerned that, you know, anybody from any one of our towns who might ask us, so what are you guys doing? 
um, the answer is something that not only is completely transparent, but completely holds up. Anyone could rationally look at it and say, okay, you're, there's a termination date on it. You're going to be able to review whether this has really worked out for all parties. And from a financial basis, it's completely clean uh, in terms of the transaction of, of resources. So um, I think that's a good summation of where we're at. Um, are there additional comments? Otherwise, for the regional committee, we have to do two, two votes. Uh, I'd entertain a motion to approve the uh, agreement with the town of Amherst for uh, the, the finance director's uh, additional role. So moved. So moved. Is it seconded? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further debate? Seeing none, uh, this does not need to be a roll call vote. All those in favor on the regional committee, please signify aye by raising your hand. It carries unanimously with the one, two, three, four, five, six people present. Uh, and I will make the same motion for Union 26. Um, Debbie, feel free to just copy and paste however you uh, <laughs> articulated that, but to paraphrase Mr. Nakajima, uh, to, for the Union 26 to approve the arrangement with the town of Amherst and um, Mr. Mangano's um, time as uh, expressed in the written proposal. So moved. Second. All, right. uh, all those in favor? And it's unanimous. Thank Congratulations you. to both of you. Thank you. <laughs> you got another job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn Union 26. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of adjourning Union 26. Okay, we're adjourned. Can I ask a funny question, by the way? 6.53. Should we have had the Union 26 approve their minutes before they adjourned? <laughs> Just saying, they're sitting there. So, you know, they got to be done sometime. I suppose we could reopen. I don't know if that's uh, without <laughs> pub publishing it. I suppose you're right. Actually, you know what? I take it back. Approval of the minutes isn't on the agenda. Oh, there you go. So there you are. You're done. <laughs> okay. It's too clever by half. That is, that's... Yeah, exactly. <coughs> Two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> Some of the parts are stronger. The, uh, all right. Uh, approval of the minutes of January 15th, uh, 2019, and January 22nd, 2019. At the beginning, I will note two things. One, the January 22nd minutes need to be edited because they currently say January 12th. Uh, and then the second thing is, for January 22nd, what I'd ask for the committee is whether they've... Um, read through them already because the last page of the minutes aren't actually published in this document and so you'd have to have looked at it already if you want to approve it otherwise we'll do it some other time but with that feel free to look through your minutes um, yes can I have a change in the minutes of January 22nd okay And number four, it said Ms. Caskinson asks, asked how sharing the town of Amherst procurement officer will help Pelham. I think what I was trying to ask is how it would affect Pelham. That would be more okay. Thank you. Okay. How it would affect. Okay. That's good. <coughs> there are other um, comments? I'd entertain a motion for January 15th. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Thanks. Because you can still edit after you mm -hmm. second it. <laughs> and obviously we're going to take them separately. Okay. Seeing no other edits, all those in favor of approving January 15th, 2019 minutes, please signify by raising your hand. Okay. The extension? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> So 501, the abstention being Ms. Kastensen. And for the 22nd, we already have two changes, the date and the item in item four. Are there any other edits? Okay, I'll take a motion to approve uh, the minutes of January 22nd with those amendments. So moved. So moved, is there a second? Second. So moved and seconded. Any further changes? 
Seeing none, all those approving signify by raising your hand. It carries unanimously six to nothing. Great. Um, so we will move on to announcements and public comment. Uh, are there any announcements from the committee members? Yes. Um, just a quick one to say that the Amherst Town Council last night uh, heard um, a draft <coughs> resolution um, and uh, a statement regarding the resolution that we passed here in this body uh, in favor of the Fund Our Future um, campaign. Yeah. And uh, they approved the resolution, and I believe they were signing it today, possibly. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> um, which is great. It's just showing you know, more uh, support outside of school committees and outside of communities and districts for this campaign. Um, and uh, hopefully we get enough of uh, interest in this around the state so that we can continue to build um, enthusiasm for changing the foundation budget, which is really very important. Great. Ms. Ms. Worland, were you? I just wanted to confirm that I heard from the town today that it has been signed and it's been sent to me. Excellent. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, this, may, this may sound like an odd announcement for the schools, but you may recall that last year, um, or was it two years ago? A while ago, uh, I think it was last year, this, the school committee um, uh, pursued support for mm -hmm. undocumented families mm -hmm. and students and also supported uh, in general uh, the effort of the town of Amherst to also support students more broadly. We had um, workshops that helped giving resources and awareness and I just I thought it was worth noting um, that you know one of the activists who's been a central leader in our community one of our neighbors uh, in support of safe communities and undocumented um, citizens residents including um, Dreamers, uh, Eduardo Simoniego, um, was has not only been detained, which I think many of us are aware, and have been writing letters and supporting him in detention in uh, Georgia, um, but also that uh, he now has at least um, pro provided some agreement over the objection of his attorneys, so it's one of those convoluted court things, um, to accept voluntary deportation mm -hmm. um, back to Mexico. and. Um, you know, he's lived in the United States for a long time. Um, I bring that up, I guess, one, because to the extent that there are members of our community who are keenly aware of this issue, either because of their friends, they are allies of people who may be undocumented, and there may be other members of our community who are, in fact, undocumented, that this is, this is an issue that may come back home to us because it's hit home pretty hard in this case. Um, I mean, it's not an announcement thing, but if at some point for the superintendent updates, you can provide additional, you know, this year's sort of update mm -hmm. on what we're doing. I think that would be a valuable thing to do because it's, it's oftentimes we hear about these things in the news and you might hear about ice raids of restaurants in Boston or whatever, um, but this is something that is acutely mm -hmm. personal for our community. Thank you. Anyway, that's sober now. I can't make it more, I can't, I, normally I make jokes and I try to be uplifting, but this one doesn't really have an uplifting ending right now, which I'm very sorry to say. Uh, are there any public comments? If there are, please come forward. You have three minutes to speak. Please identify yourself, and we would welcome hearing any of your thoughts. I guess I always forget how much like the camera shows of the audience and whether people watching at home are aware that other than a couple of people who are here to present to us, there's like nobody here, <laughs> except for Amber's Media, who are awesome. We think you guys are awesome. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, subcommittee updates. Do you have any subcommittee updates? I can um, uh, update on the policy subcommittee we met Great. last week, um, reviewed some policies, and I believe we're bringing them back for set for second read um, uh, at our next meeting. Um, we reviewed um, fundraising policy, um, and have a, and we'll be meeting again next week. We we meet once a month, but because of all of our full school committee meetings we got pushed off into met last week and we're going to be again in a couple of weeks um, and be looking at um, some other new policies that are out of date. Great. Are there other subcommittee updates? Seeing none, we'll move on. Superintendent's update. Superintendent. S see if I can keep this nice pace rolling. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> Take your time. Um, 
So a uh, good segue into Amherst Media and thanking them. So uh, this afternoon at 12.45, there's a reason I'm saying the time, which we'll get to in a second, uh, I had the opportunity to interview John Bechtold, who was here at this body, I think at the last meeting, um, yeah. as well as uh, a high school senior um, who was involved in the Laramie Project. And uh, it was, a one. I think, people will find it to be one of the most engaging episodes of Window into Arps that we've had just because it truly turned into a conversation uh, about the Laramie Project, the impact, and it was wonderful having a student participate. So that's it's not the first, uh, I'd have to think about what was the first time, but it's, been, it's not been the typical, it's usually about the educators uh, or community members, and this student, uh, I've known since she was a young student at Crocker Farm, so this was another neat treat for me. Um, but it was, just, it was a wonderful um, episode, and so the reason I said it's, it was filmed at 12.45 is that at 5.21 this, af this afternoon, I got an email from Amherst Media saying they'd edited it already and was live and on, already online. So oh, wow. <laughs> that is a new record for timeliness, uh, <laughs> responsiveness, or whatever word I can come up with. It was, uh, they were absolutely wonderful working and, and making a student who hadn't done this before feel very comfortable. And so I think it'll be a great episode. It'll be on our social media tomorrow and it'll be in the Superintendent Update on Friday. Can I offer a mild editorial that, that um, <clears throat> we've had a couple meetings recently that have been really long. One of them was Reach and one was like that joint meeting we had, which included mm -hmm. Region 26. And oh my God, are these meetings long. And just, you know, one of the groups that we never hear complaints from, that frankly have every right to complain to us, I mean, seriously, because they don't make the agenda, they have every right to complain is Amherst Media, and they don't, and they're awesome, and they do great work. Absolutely. Yep. And we've been doing more Windows episodes than we've done in past years, and they're excited and responsive, and organize themselves a little differently in a streamlined way, both for themselves and for, for district this year. So I, they knew of a new intro for the episodes. If you've watched them, you've known that they've actually done an animated introduction. So I completely endorse and agree with that statement. Can I just yeah, please. add a, a quick uh, kudos since we're all loving Amherst Media right now? <laughs> just to say the importance of community television, right, and in community uh, media. Um, and that's, you know, this is a nonprofit organization that uh, happens to, to be at every single one of our meetings. Um, but it's providing a window into not just districts, you know, um, work, but also into our local government's work and everything. So, you know, really appreciate the work of, of our, our uh, both our staff and interns for Emers Media. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to delay ourselves back on the schedule. <laughs> right. Yeah. The next one has to do with like weather, so people won't be that excited. So uh, we hopefully will have a farm to school launch event Thursday morning, um, and um, it's scheduled to be at Amherst College. However, the temperatures are expected to plunge very, very deeply Wednesday night to Thursday. So I did talk to you know Sasha Palmer, our food service director, who is organizing the event. That. If we do have a delay, you know, certainly I could still be there, but it, there's a lot of staff who are planning to attend, and it may not be, it may need to be rescheduled. Mm -hmm. So, um, sort of, if there's a normal school day on Thursday morning, we'll go forward as planned. If there's a, any sort of delay, it'll have to be rescheduled because it'll throw off the whole, the whole morning. Um, so the conversation before the meeting started about school committee members were joking around requests for s snow days and delays. That we have some complicated weather this week. Uh, if you look at the Midwest, they have really complicated weather this week. So. Well, I am prone to complain about the cold. Uh, friends in Minnesota shared me their temperatures over the last three days. I will not be complaining publicly about the cold this week. Um, I will be complaining, however, about the governor's budget update that Mr. Mangano will get into uh, more detail as we do the budget. Um, the charter reimbursement formula, uh, again, we'll, we'll do this in the budget, but I think it, I wanted to highlight it, and that's why mm -hmm. I included it in superintendent update. Um, has significantly negative ramifications for the regional school district. I also think um, I was talking to Mr. Brockman about this because, um, as you can tell from me emphasizing this, this is an area that I feel strongly about advocacy. Um, I actually don't believe that there's a logic model that makes a whole lot of sense uh, as it relates to changes in the charter reimbursement formula. Again, we'll get into the weeds of that later. I just want to highlight it so that when Mr. Mangano is presenting, there's some context to that one. Um, um, professional development for staff. This is just an update that we have a number of things going on. Um, you know, the special ed department and the human resources department are partnering around the special education moderate disabilities license. They have um, over 20 staff members who express some interest in participating. They're doing um, meetings and quasi-interviews to assess for um, where people are on their continuum, what supports they would need, which is really exciting that the interest from our staff to 
kind of some of them are paraeducators, but some of them are regular, you know, are regular education teachers who want to further develop their skills in working with all students. Um, the Spanish classes started last week, so that um, is a regional item because we do have regional teachers uh, taking it. The feedback I heard uh, already was it's fantastic, their instructors are great, and this is a serious <coughs> course where people are actively practicing. The feedback I heard was at the high school uh, yesterday, and I heard two teachers in the course trying to, you know, their, their job, although they're new, they've, they've taken one class in Spanish just to practice what they've learned, and they were seriously practicing. And they didn't know, I was just walking in the hallway. So people are, staff are taking it seriously and wanting to much more deeply and quickly uh, develop their skills, um, at least at a, you know, base conversational survival level in Spanish. So that's really exciting. Uh, and we also have a intermediate level Spanish class that is also open to staff across the multiple districts for staff with some Spanish skills but need to develop, further develop it. Um, last Saturday there was uh, the, the annual Martin Luther King breakfast was there and um, our, one of our, our middle school co-principal Joseph Smith was awarded the Norma Jean Anderson Civil Rights and Academic Achievement Award. She was nominated, he was nominated by a student in middle school which I think is worth mentioning. Um, and uh, our student, uh, Carrington Dow, uh, was a recipient of one of the Martin Luther King scholarships that are given to high school seniors. And there was, and we've talked about this family here before, uh, started the year this way, actually, uh, talking about some of these folks, but uh, Barry Brooks was on hand for a special dedication to his wife, Judy Brooks. Um, and the last thing, Mr. Sullivan's aware of this, I know he can't be here tonight because of the impending, I think maybe starting snow from text I'm getting, um, is that on Thursday we'll be at Shutesbury School Committee, no matter how cold it will be, we'll be at Shutesbury Elementary School to meet with Shutesbury families, talk to them about the middle school and high school, so the co-principals uh, as well as um, Dr. Gramacki will be with me uh, meeting with Shutesbury families, and I want to thank the Shutesbury Elementary School who have been blasting out emails reminding families and sending our flyer around. It's apparently everywhere in the school, like one can't miss it. So hopefully the cold doesn't co keep uh, families away, but in Shutesbury I don't think it will. Um, Mr. Sullivan has promised some baked goods as well, which is another draw. Um, and certainly I expect, you know, I don't, you know, he's the representative of Shutesbury, but I just wanted to let the committee know that that was happening. The Levert event is uh, about a month from now. Uh, oh, actually, I want to add something to the update because Mr. Nakajima raised it about immigration. So just briefly, we have had um, two events around supporting undocumented um, students and families in our schools. So the first is we had our presentation, which I um, was able to participate or observe part of back in the kind of mid-fall for families because um, it's been two years since we did that and right high schools that means half the school wasn't here half the high school student body wasn't here last time we did it for any student who was interested and we had a good turnout of students for the session um, really interesting discussion and questions they asked as well um, and to Mr. Nakajima's point uh, one of the more poignant moments I've had in my career is just um, seeing the real deep-seated uh, concern, and I'm going to use, use the word fear, of the current climate and, and what, how that would all play out for you know, 14 to 18 year olds in our schools. And they were able to voice that very clearly um, and ask questions about it. This year what was new is we followed up and gave students and families the opportunity for individual sessions with folks who did the presentation. Um, just to be clear, because legally we have to be, uh, they weren't giving uh, official legal advice, they weren't the counsel of any families or students that would um, play off um, in some, some ways that we can't do, but they were able to offer their, uh, understand families um, who would come in to share, here's where I am, here's my experience, what next steps would you recommend, and, and be able to give them advice of what they can do to, um, in, a, in a range of scenarios that families and students were worried about. So the difference was last time we did the whole one with students, and this time we included a, a more individual family and student connection, and we had several families and students who did take us up on that offer and did have private meetings with uh, the good folks from PEAR, which is the organization based in Boston that we work with. Um, I want to also add to the point of any time there's something in the newspaper about someone being deported from our community, what we hear immediately is the ripple effects within within um, our families and our community. So I do, I do appreciate you raising that, and even if that person who I've met, uh, and many of you have, isn't directly connected to the ARPS community, uh, indirectly, it, it affects everybody here, and it affects um, particularly our most, some of our more vulnerable families um, much more so than everybody else. So uh, it is being felt. Um, we have gotten inquiries. We've gotten questions. And every time there's 
any newspaper articles about raids or sweeps anywhere in Massachusetts, even if it's in Chelsea or somewhere far from here, uh, our families call the next morning and, and want information and, and I really want to acknowledge the Family Center who are on the front lines of fielding those phone calls and supporting families and working uh, actively with them to feel, um, feel that they're part of this community despite the national and sometimes local uh, context for them. So I want to offer that update. I know it wasn't written down, but I'm glad you prompted me. Glad you offered it. Are there um, questions with the superintendent? Any comments? No, I really appreciate it. And uh, I had a brain cramp. It's 2019. That yeah. was two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Good grief. Yeah. Can you imagine? <coughs> two, we've lived with this for two years. Yeah. Over two years, a little over two years. It's terrible. Um, so uh, we, the, uh, just with the chair's report briefly, and I, I don't know if Mr. McDonough is going to talk about it in a little bit, but the, but, um, the non-regional assessment working group, um, it's like uh, Prince, yep. the artist formerly known <laughs> as the regional assessment working group, um, has, uh, but we've been meeting and we met again. Um, it looked like we were, the, the, the still the, the bias that the towns came in with, saying we're going to try to hold harmless uh, the regional district is still held for the moment, um, hopefully continues to hold. Uh, the uh, governor's budget was also bad um, for that conversation because the minimum contribution went up uh, for uh, particularly Leverett, one of the towns. And, you know, as you know, it's just a formula, right? Yeah. So, like, once you move one component of it, it throws everything else out of whack to try to figure out how do you how do you get to um, a series of ratios that could both be fair, would be approved by DESE, so they'd look at it and say this makes sense to us, mm -hmm. and also it doesn't have an immediate hit on any in a given town's budget in a way that's beyond what they can what they can expect. And so um, we're going to meet again next week as that small group. Uh, and I guess when you're talking later, you can offer an update yeah. if you have one yeah. on this subject. Um, the, the, the spirit of the enterprise is still that people are trying to work well together and come out with something uh, a formula that all the towns can support that um, can uh, work for our budget and I think even there's a hint of trying to find a solution that would carry us forward a couple of years into the future mm -hmm. at least so that the district and it's kind of funny once we stop trying to find a permanent solution we've started to come closer <laughs> to actually finding <laughs> a permanent solution and I think also I think the noise that happens in this as you, because we, and I think it's, well, I'm happy about all, everyone on the committee has had enough experience with this to see at least some of the spreadsheets and how the numbers move fly around this way and that, is I think we're enough years into every town seeing how their ox could get gored by this that people understand that there's nothing uh, either mysterious or malicious about the formulas, and we just got to work together to find one. So I'm, I just appreciate that as an update to folks, and we're going to come back to the committee, obviously, with more on the subject. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, we are ahead of schedule. This is good. I know I was told not to jinx it, but uh, I'm not trying to jinx anything. Uh, so I'm going to move on, though, to 8A uh, Master Facilities Use Presentation uh, and would love an, an introduction. Yeah. So um, before uh, I introduce uh, our guests who will be doing most of the talking, I just want to bring back to last year's capital plan uh, that was approved included a, uh, a commitment to hire architects to work with us to look at a range of options about how we're using our secondary facilities. In particular, the um, interest in this really came from Fort Towns meeting, multiple Fort Towns meetings, I should say, uh, to understand better twofold. One is, do students in a variety of configurations, which I'll be at to in a second, can students fit? You know, uh, in you know, for can sixth graders fit in the middle school? Can seventh and eighth graders fit in the high school? Yes, no, and then the additional piece is how would they fit, right? Um, so that's like question 1B, because uh, just fitting is not going to be sufficient. We want to think about the educational reality of that. The second question is what are some of the financial implications of, of um, putting sixth graders in the middle school, and what are some of the financial implications of putting seventh and eighth graders in the high school? And I want to draw the line in the sand that we were specific about not talking about educational implications writ large that the goal of this study is to understand better the infrastructure, the logistics, the design, uh, and then for this to come back to the regional school committee this <coughs> morning to have active conversation to say, 
are any of these worth pursuing? Do we want to put more resources and time and, and staff time and, and perhaps consultant time into developing a more fleshed out version of what this would actually look like uh, for our students and staff? Um, and I think it's been really helpful. We've actually received, we had our last, uh, which I know um, our consultants will talk about, we had our first um, advisory board meeting, which we, we had conversation here. We had a great showing. We ended up just opening it up to everyone who wanted because it ended up being a nice size of, I think, about 18 or so people. 16, 16 thank mm -hmm. you. And uh, one of the pieces that uh, feedback that we received is as opposed to prior efforts to really being very focused on what the task is and not trying to take on every possible uh, implication made people feel much more comfortable to participate, to engage, uh, and to know what the role, their role is as an advisory board, what the district was doing, uh, what our team of consultants was doing. So I really want to thank that. That was a lot of conversation, even last spring, about what we were asking for in capital projects. And I feel like sometimes you look back and you're like, oh, I wish I'd done this differently. I think this is one that collectively the board, um, the school committee rather, that is, um, made some really good decisions about. Uh, what outcomes we'd want to have. Um, and I think that clarity is really helping the process move smoothly along. With that, I want to thank um, Doug Roberts and Jim Hoagland, who are from JCJ Architecture, for coming tonight. Um, and they'll, they'll, we talked about roughly half an hour of walking you through the slides, and that, that would leave oh, 15, 15 minutes, I'm sorry, 15 minutes of walking you through slides, and that would leave 15 minutes for a question and answer. Um, and at this point, uh, we decided to have them come, just want to add one wrinkle. Uh, or not wrinkle, but just comment, that we had just had them have them come at the front end so that the committee was fully abreast and aware of the developments, what the work plan was, when the deliverables would be. Sometimes we wait too long and sometimes to have consultants come in and then the committee doesn't feel like they're in the loop. And we thought, and Ms. Gassenson was in that conversation as the rep to this, that we wanted to have the consultants in to let you know how are things going and where are they going uh, before we get to closure. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. And with that, great. thank you. Um, we're happy to be here. Uh, Dr. Morris, thank you for the introduction. Uh, Doug Roberts uh, with JCJ Architecture, Jim Hoagland. Uh, you may remember JCJ Architecture was the architect for the Wildwood Elementary School study that was uh, uh, completed a couple of years ago. So we're happy to be back in the community and uh, using the information that we learned and knowledge to apply to this uh, challenge ahead of us as well. Uh, we were hired by the district in the middle of December to embark on this task and given the goal of having it accomplished by the end of March. I'm trying to advance the slide here. Is it not? I'll do the manual. Do the manual? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just advance through that too. And in order to do that, again, uh, we felt that uh, it was important that we had a very detailed and uh, detailed work plan so that we identified a series of meetings, a uh, total of nine, where we would be meeting with various uh, working groups and uh, as uh, Dr. Morris mentioned, the advisory board, as well as yourselves, so that we would re solicit feedback from the community so that we were tailoring the study and the recommendations so that we were building consensus along the way. That's one of the lessons that we learned from the previous study that uh, the expectation is, we don't know when, but ultimately we're hopeful that this may lead to a statement of interest that would be received by the Massachusetts School Building Authority. So we wanted to make sure that we had the groundwork there for successful application. Um, in that three month period, we've identified nine different meetings where we started off on January 2nd, meeting with the working group, had representatives of the school committee, uh, the district administration, and faculty and staff members from the middle and high school. Uh, we are in fact-finding mode, so what we're trying to do is find out, as Dr. Morris touched upon, the actual existing program. We don't have an educational program looking ahead. We're really testing what your programs are today and how we consolidate them in the different grade configurations to really have a, a baseline from which to make decisions in the future. Uh, building on that, we then met with the facilities advise, uh, Facility Use Advisory Board last Thursday, and again, 16 members. All members of the working group are represented as well as members of the public. Uh, it was a great exchange. We explained to the group what they are, what they're not. It's not a voting body. It really is a feedback uh, opportunity to get the pulse of the community. So we give shape to the study. Uh, the one takeaway that we uh, learned from that uh, feedback loop was that one of the voices that wasn't at the table was the voice of the student. Hmm. So we want to work with the district who understand how we can integrate that into the study as well. 
So you'll see a series of steps. Middle of February, we're forecasting to have our conceptual designs that Jim Hoagland will talk about available so that we can start developing some cost models. Because ultimately, we would like to know what the impacts are on the facilities. Can we make use of um, uh, existing underutilized space, or are there needs for additions? And uh, with that, we can then have a draft study available middle of March for review and comment, ultimately presenting the final report at the end of March. As I indicated, we are in the fact-finding stage of the project right now, understanding the program. Again, with the eye to the future towards MSBA participation, we wanted to use the MSBA space program template as the baseline. Uh, so we're using that to develop an, a, a, the space models so that we can test what the existing facilities will support. Add to that, from our previous work in Amherst, we are aware that your class sizes are historically smaller than those that are typically embedded in the uh, MSBA template. On average, about four students less per classroom. Less students per classroom, you have more classroom needs. <coughs> so we want to make sure that that template actually is specific to Amherst. And in addition to that, you offer a very robust special education program. So we want to make sure that we overlaid that on the space uh, template. So we're actually working with the Amherst template. And as you can see in the charts there, there's the different steps about how we were able to develop the different space programs for the multitude of great options that we were to consider. So go, going hand in hand with the program studies, um, trying to understand the MSPA guidelines, Amherst needs, as well as what's physically in the building right now. Um, I, I think that's <coughs> probably the biggest piece of the puzzle for us right now. So we are currently spending time in the buildings, walking through, um, we've been given a series of um, packages of information, um, but we're at this point very concerned, well, very, very interested in learning as much as we can about the physical condition of the buildings. And that includes building codes. Um, the, the years that these buildings were built, you know, many, many years, 50, 50 years ago, building codes were much different. Um, Commonwealth just adopted the most recent International Building Code, the 2015 version of that, along with amendments that, that make up the Massachusetts State Building Code. Um, it's all going to come into play here, and that involves plumbing fixture counts, how many toilets, sinks you have in the building, um, exit capacity for stairs, um, as well as ADA accessibility. As you try to move through this building, um, there are some challenges. Um, those are some of the pieces of information that have been given to us. We're starting to really kind of go through, understand, and ultimately will be folded into the final report. Um, big, big piece of the puzzle. Um, another piece of the puzzle is how these buildings actually physically fit on the site themselves. So we're going through understanding zoning analysis. So if some of the options that we are looking at um, require an addition to any of these buildings, we need to understand what the zoning is going to allow us. If, if we're looking at a four-story addition, not allowed by zoning. So it, it somewhat brings us back to reality, helps us focus on the possible options ahead of us, um, but also, once again, a very important piece of the puzzle, understanding how the zones uh, work and, and what we're really allowed to do. Um, that's going to in, in involve um, the building site coverage, how, building, how big the building can physically be on the site. Um, it will drive some of our parking decisions as to how parking lots get reconfigured. Um, so a very overarching idea, but a, a very important detail in, in what we're looking at currently. Um, the, the bullet points that you see on the screen right now is just a quick summary of the reports that we have been given. Um, we've given existing drawings in PDF form. Um, we have a couple of AutoCAD files that we've received, um, as well as uh, the recent athletic field study. Um, I believe that you were presented that. Um, any addition that we may be looking at at the high school is going to impact per perhaps the preferred option that you're looking at. So once again, the building and site need to be looked at comprehensively. One's going to affect the other. Um, and we, we need to understand what may be happening in the future. Um, accessibility reports, I, I believe, was just presented last week. Mm -hmm. um, that, that group went through the building, identified a um, series of ADA issues that, that need to be corrected. Um, we are going to propose folding all of that into any renovation work that gets proposed. Um, and in some cases, there may be um, scenarios that get um, presented and proposed 
that would preclude that work actually being done. We may end up looking at some demolition in part of the building that would make some of those problems go away. And then as, as part of renovation or new construction, all of that gets corrected. Um, so once again, a big piece of the puzzle. There, there were some, some significant dollars that were attached to some of that corrective work. We need to understand as part of the big picture. Um, recent roof report was given to us, um, as well as some, some existing plans. So what we were really charged with was getting into each of the buildings, middle school and the high school, really understanding um, some of the adjacencies, how the, the education is currently being delivered, how that ties in with curriculum, and then the physical condition of all, all these spaces, the systems. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on the middle school first. And, and we've gotten some wonderful feedback through our first four meetings, uh, very interactive back and forth. Um, the people in the community really understand the buildings very well. We've spent time in the buildings. Um, we look at it through a slightly different lens. So a lot of the things that we're hearing back um, are very helpful because it's from staff, it's from the public, it's from parents in the school. Um, and we're looking at it from an architectural and engineering standpoint. So um, the middle school site, we're, we're looking at um, understanding how the buses arrive, how the parents drop off. Um, and this, this is just a very simple diagram um, identifying main entry points. Um, you have an entry point for um, the parents, uh, central office, uh, the main entry for the building, as well as leisure services share part of that. Um, so understanding how all of that gets separated, um, how you control who gets to what part of the building, I think is very important at this part. And if we're truly looking at a facility use standpoint, <coughs> I think it's important to know the utilization of each and every piece of that building and, and whether we can constrict that, if we can move big chunks of space in and out. Um, so the site obviously compared, you know, ties directly to uh, the floor plans. Um, these, these are some high level diagrams. Um, we did get CAD plans for, for the buildings and we're now able to do very precise uh, area takeoffs within exact uh, classrooms and determine you know, that this classroom is 683 square feet, it's not 800 square feet. Um, and that, that's going to be really helpful as we begin to try to fit all of these programs throughout the building. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. We can go through the first floor, the second floor. Um, the next plan, um, we, we did a series of very high level diagrams that we've presented over the last few weeks. Um, and these high level diagrams are really designed to look at big chunks of space and figure out how that big chunk of space fits in the building and how it could potentially get moved to another building, a different space within this building. Um, and I, I think these were very successful with the larger group that we dealt with last week. Um, I think they understood the proposal and looking at big chunks of square footage. So th this is one of the examples that we looked at for the six through eight scenario. So you, you currently have the seventh and eighth grade in this building. Um, this scenario proposes adding the sixth grade, making a true six through eight middle school bumps up the student enrollment, uh, the population in the building. Um, so what we're proposing in this diagram would be to move the central office from its current location to the back part of the building. So you see the red portion highlighted is actually a very underutilized section of the building where the old work wood shop is. It's just being used for some storage and some workshops for uh, custodians at this point. If that were to move, it actually frees up a significant chunk of space in a critical point in the middle school. We could move the existing uh, main office for the middle school out to where central office is now, create a very secured entry. Right now, central office has a secured entry, but the people that are coming to the middle school come into the main lobby, get buzzed in, they're already into the school, they don't, you know, they, they could just run right up the stairs. Um, so by making that simple move, um, it frees up a ton of space and it actually gives us enough space to do some minor renovations on the lower level where we, we could accommodate all of the sixth grades, uh, sixth graders. You would have two teams plus um, a, a possibly a, a half team on the first floor. Um, you would have ac direct access to the cafeteria, um, an adjacency with a kitchen. 
Um, and then what, what we would do is move the seventh and eighth graders to the upper level. So it, ne it becomes a natural vertical separation. So the sixth graders transition to the middle school, occupy the first floor, and then uh, we would do some minor renovations to, to accommodate that. The nice thing about this is that it, it keeps the auditorium in place, utilizes all of the existing uh, uh, music rooms. Um, if you could go to the second floor. So the diagram goes to the second floor. We would maintain the existing library um, in its configuration, um, but we would rearrange some of, uh, or reutilize some of the spaces. All of the science rooms are at the front part of the building on, on the second floor. Those are larger rooms. Um, typically the middle school um, teams, so you have the four classrooms that make up a team, science is included in that. So we would actually propose doing some renovations to existing classrooms to turn those into science labs and then utilize the existing science labs as new art rooms. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure in those, uh, plumbing infrastructures in those current rooms. We think it's a fairly straightforward renovation to be able to do that. It would group all three art rooms um, in that area. The teachers could share some time, prep periods. Um, you could share storage in that area. Um, and and it's, it's right at the front stairs. So the sixth graders that would be located on the lower level would easily be able to traverse up and down that stair to their art classroom and the library and then go right back down to their teams on the lower level. Um, you can see on the far left side of this diagram, the pool, gymnasium, and all the locker rooms would, would remain pretty much as is. We, you know, we could do some, some renovations. Um, uh, ultimately, we're going to be proposing major renovations, most likely to the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, simply because of the age of those systems in this building. That's right, and, and rearranging this, uh, the, the spaces that you see labeled foreign language are currently windowless classrooms. Um, we feel that if you could offer foreign language maybe two or three times a week, um, the students would spend a minimal amount of time in those windowless classrooms. Um, you know, the, the lion's share of their time would be spent in the teams, and all of those, the, the intention would be for all of those classrooms to have windows to the outside. Um, we're just utilizing some of those interior windowless spaces in a slightly different way. Um, and, and I think scheduling that, I think it makes sense. We could, we could actually introduce some storage spaces and some staff planning rooms in, in those interior spaces. And make foreign language available to your uh, sixth grade students as well. Yep. So the initial feedback, we, we heard a lot of positives from, from the group that we ran these diagrams by last week. And, and, and that was one of the, the big pluses, being able to offer foreign language mm -hmm. to all the sixth graders. Do you want to take questions now or run through? Um, let, let me get through the, the high school portion. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a, a scenario I'm going to run through, and then, then we can always back up right. and take a look at these. Okay, so, so we've taken a similar look at the high school building. Um, this is just an overall view to orient where the building is. Um, and I think in the high school scenario, it's a little more important the relationship um, to the fields and the, and the site and how the students traverse from the building to the site, all the athletic fields. So um, just analyzing that, you can see this quick overlay highlights where the play fields are. Um, and in this case, we have the buses coming across the front of the building doing drop-off. Um, and we also have um, vans <coughs> coming for Summit Academy. Somewhat complicates the vehicular circulation on site. Um, they do have a dedicated entry in and out um, with a recent renovation that was done there. Um, and in the high school scenario, we also have student drivers coming, which needs to be thought about. Um, I think there's a great opportunity to rethink how the site is organized somewhat. Um, some of our past experiences, we, uh, we had some conversations about emergency access throughout uh, the entire building. Um, there may be, if, if this becomes a major renovation, there may be a request made to create an emergency um, loop around the back of the building, which could potentially impact you know, where we might want to put an addition. Um, so all things that we're weighing right now, and, and we're trying to look at this as a, as, as a high level view, trying to identify all the potential issues with any of the scenarios that we begin to look at um, relating the building and the site together. And just, it's not a question, it's just an ad. So just the emergency drive piece has been a request from the Amherst Police Department. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's a regional school, but it happens to be located in the town of Amherst, so they're the responding group mm -hmm. that um, 
from a safety perspective, all buildings now would be built with an ability to have an emergency drive around the building, and, and the high school in particular doesn't quite have one that's that the police can use. So that's I just want to clarify that that's where the mm -hmm. request came from. It wasn't coming from us necessarily, although I tend to agree with the police about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so another big piece of this puzzle is uh, the field study that was recently done. Um, I think you need to be cognizant of the fact of what may be implemented here. Um, if the track and, and main competition field get relocated to where the preferred option is saying, um, there, there may be an impact on some of the parking, um, vehicular circulation. So we certainly don't want to propose something as part of this study that would undo some really solid thinking on the field's um, study as well. So obviously one, one, one goes with the other. Um, we've documented the, the existing building. Um, it is a big, sprawling building. Um, it's over two, you know, almost 240,000 square feet. Um, the wings are oriented, and, and you can tell that certain things have been added on over the years. So the general thought process behind it and organization of the building um, it is a big part of our thinking right now. So if we're introducing more students, different students, how can we reorganize this in a, in a thoughtful way? Um, and one of the, um, the, the scenarios that we were presented with was looking at introducing seventh and eighth graders to this building. So um, a significant chunk of, of space. Um, so some of the things that work well in the high school are the access to some of the, the um, community-related spaces, the cafeteria, the library that we're in right now, um, as well as the auditorium, um, all along that main spine. Um, so this scenario, if we're introducing seventh and eighth grade, significant chunk of, of enrollment, students that are adding to this building, um, and one of the things that we've heard is that the seventh and eighth graders, it's desired to be somewhat separate from the ninth through twelfth graders. Having a seventh grader interact with a twelfth grader, I know parents look and it's a big age discrepancy. And how is my middle schooler going to interact with some of these older students? Um, so what we tried to do in this scenario by the nature of the building was give the seventh and eighth graders really their own space. Um, so this scenario looks at putting all the 7th and 8th graders across the back part of the building. Um, and you can see that where the 8th grade is labeled, it's actually some old wood shops and some tech labs that are, that are back there. And we feel are somewhat underutilized. So with some renovations in those spaces, we could actually turn them into nice classrooms, um, group the teams to operate in a middle school format. Um, and really be completely independent of the high school portion. Um, this scenario does displace some of those high school programs that are there. Um, so I believe we're going to need to propose some sort of addition to the high school to accommodate the larger enrollment. Uh, you can see the three-story classroom addition, which is uh, uh, proposed on the back side. Um, it actually interferes with one of the multi-purpose fields that's being proposed in the field study and it could potentially interfere with the emergency loop that, that may be required or requested as, as part of this project as well. Um, one of the feedback pieces that we got last Thursday was the potential of creating a, a cafeteria solely for the 7th and 8th graders um, because of the capacity, the existing capacity in the cafeteria um, for the high schoolers. Adding another wave to that, I think, becomes a scheduling issue. Um, throughout the day. Um, we certainly don't want high school kids or seventh graders eating at 9.30 in the morning just to accommodate that. Um, so any number of scenarios we could put a cafeteria addition on and expand that. Um, it would expand the capacity there. We could keep the same number of lunch waves, um, but there would be more students in that space. The other scenario would be to create a seventh and eighth grade cafeteria um, in the first story of that three-story classroom addition, mm -hmm. and what's labeled art right now may become a small cafeteria. So all the food prep would happen in the kitchen, mm -hmm. and then we'd have a warming kitchen, and the seventh and eighth graders would have their own dedicated space potentially. Um, plays right into how the program goes and how it all comes together. Um, so, but the rest of the building remains similar. Um, the main entry would remain where it is, um, the library, 
What's that? For the high school. Yes, for the, for the high school, sorry. Um, and the gymnasiums would all pretty much remain in the same location. Um, once again, we'd be probably most likely looking at full mechanical, electrical, plumbing upgrades, um, and that we'll delve into a little bit more detail in the future and, and will play a big part in the final number and, and budget that we look at. So, um, the upper floors of this scenario, um, once again, would take advantage of the three-story classroom addition. We'd add uh, high school classrooms at the back portion of that. Um, so you can see the second and third floors. Um, I, I believe we could probably leave the department structure very much as it is right now um, with the science and art department on the second floor um, and the math department split between the second and third and then social studies on the, on the upper level. Um, I think we'd be able to add enough classrooms um, and on the second and third floor to accommodate all of the high school needs. Uh, minimal disruption <coughs> to, to the departmental structure. So um, at a very high level, um, I, I just want to remind everybody that at this point we're, we're about two weeks in earnest into looking at these, these diagrams. Uh, there's going to be many more diagrams to follow. Um, and it, we find it's a great quick way to ex explore some big picture ideas. You know, what if we move this group here? What if? Um, so uh, hopefully the diagrams kind of helped you get your mind into it a little bit. And uh, as we told the group last Thursday, um, we're, we're very open to hearing ideas. Um, you're, you're very familiar with the schools. And at this point in the study, there's no, no idea is a bad idea. I feel like we need to explore every single option. Um, and so we're, we're certainly open for, for ideas, options, questions. Um, but that, that's kind of where we are right now. Great. Thanks. Mr. Demo, you had a question earlier, or do you want to? Um, yeah, off? I just wanted to. I, I, d I don't want to make a mistake procedurally with our open meeting law. And yeah. So I, w I just want to ask a clarifying <laughs> question because I, I want some advice because half this presentation is about moving six to the middle school, and yeah. we have a quorum of a committee um, that uh, oversees sixth, and our, our our district, our committee right yeah. now does not oversee sixth. So, grade. so I really think the question should be about the building and the blocking and the usage uh, around the middle school. And I think, I think the interaction of those elements is appropriate, meaning is this going to work to have sixth grade and seventh grade both using the art room? Like that's a legitimate question. Saying, just for the sake of argument, saying let's talk about how we're going to organize, how, what would the impact be on organizing our sixth grade? And how well does that fit our current education model? Would not be okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly. Well, I mean, the only other thing we could say is don't ask any questions about the middle school. Okay, right. right? Uh, and I don't uh, think that makes a lot of sense. Well, Sorry, go ahead. All right, so, I'm, so a couple other questions. So you tell me if this is in yeah, scope yeah, yeah. or out of scope. Because I'm, I'm not trying to be hide. It's really, I'm a little confused. So like the, when we're talking about, like, is there space enough for the sixth graders, I'm wondering... What, what numbers are those coming from? Is that from all four districts? Is that just from Amherst? And there was also reference to this. Uh, That's a reasonable MS. question yeah. because it's about blocking out the space. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the other question is there was reference to the MSBA participation process driving this, and I don't know what that was. Well, that's certainly legitimate because that would be true with any change. So I can turn to the first one. Um, sure. So we, we've looked at and we've talked about multiple scenarios. Um, I think one thing to note if you're looking at these is, is using – an MSBA scenario, and I'm not talking about the funding, I'm just saying to play that out, and actually what most middle school and high schools use is that um, they're shared spaces for teachers. Because of our declining enrollment currently, our secondary teachers have uh, quote unquote ownership of their classrooms 100% of the day. So if they have two preps in a day, no one else comes and uses their classroom. Uh, and an MSBA template, or that how it used to be, you know, and I'm not going to reference anyone's prior time in the Amherst Regional Schools particularly. But um, when it was, when the enrollment was much higher, um, it meant that, you know, the, the classrooms were used every period of the day. So that if I have two preps during the day and Mr. Mangano is the math teacher, um, and we're both math teachers, when I'm not teaching, Mr. Mangano may be using my space. So when you're looking at the number of classrooms dedicated, uh, you have to think in a mindset that's a little different than how our secondary mindset currently, and our elementary mindset, currently is. Um, so we did look at multiple <coughs> options, the impact of Pelham, Leverett, and Shutesbury 
you know, increases the numbers by about 60 students, um, if you include all three of those to the Amherst numbers. Um, and that's, I think, some of the future work we're planning to work on with, with our team is, you know, what, how, what are the implications of those different models? If there's 60 more sixth graders, do they fit? How do they go? But it's certainly in the mindset that we've had lots of conversation about. Right, and we use the nasty uh, demographic data from 2021. That seemed to be the worst case scenario. So again, for any planning, we wanted to make sure what would be a realistic target and layered on all of the sixth grades from the different uh, uh, towns. And but to be clear, what you said, what I think the superintendent was saying, I thought I heard her saying, is that you're not, this original sort of just rough blocking wasn't doing that, but it would do that later? So, I'm sorry, you could, it, it currently does. Oh, we're it does, trying okay. to anticipate that. <coughs> Again, it's a conversation that we're starting. Uh, it's going to include all of the communities that would be impacted by this if it is moved forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's exactly, it's conceptual. Yeah. Right. Is it and then if sorry. I could address the MSBA uh, reference, we're using that to help benchmark our study. It's uh, something that is a constant within the Commonwealth, and it's a uh, foundation that can be used to build on for future efforts. It's not to suggest that they're actively participating in it today or tomorrow in five years, but if it does go down that path, you're on a solid footing moving forward. And I, I, I want to add that I think a lot of the scenarios that we're talking through, if it moves forward, MSBA is going to ask you, did you look at these scenarios? So we're trying to anticipate a lot of the questions at that level. I mean, we've been through the process many times, and, and we kind of know the questions that they are going to ask. Um, the other thing I wanted to add was um, we're, we're developing a matrix. So the two um, scenarios that we showed you, one at the middle school, one at the high school, obviously wouldn't get paired together. So if we put seventh and eighth grade in the high school, sixth grade could potentially stay at the elementary schools and there would be no students in the middle school. So that would be one scenario. And then you start looking at what is the facility use of the middle school building if it's empty of students. Are there other town functions we could put in there? So the matrix, I think, is going to pair up the different scenarios. So, you, you know, you, you'd never look at the middle school option that we showed you with the high school option side by side. But standalone, if you looked at the six through eight in, a, in the middle school, there would be no impact at the high school. The high school would just remain as it is as a nine through 12. Um, so, and then each of our budget and pricing options will then get folded into that <coughs> matrix and paired up together. So I, I, I saw Ms. Ardonias and then Mr. Minino, but I wanted to piggyback on that. So is there, a th is there or is there not a third alternative in which the seventh and eighth grade move to the high school and an alternative elementary educational use is conceived for the middle school or not? Potentially, yeah. We, we did look at the enrollment, how many sixth graders would fit into the middle school building and they, they fill up a very small portion okay. of the building so once again it begs the question what would that facility the rest of the facility be used for because it is under no that, ma that makes sense sir. Yeah. I think you were asking let me just see if I can yeah. understand that if if the middle school was vacated could it be used for well I was just yeah. literally the scenarios they just spoke about yeah. were binary right that either mm -hmm. you have the sixth and seventh and eighth grade <laughs> in the right middle school and then nothing happens at the high school, or you move the seventh and eighth grade to the high school and the middle school doesn't have any educational use. And so it, it begged the question of whether there was actually a third scenario in which there's still an educational use for the middle school, even if there's then some other space that's left over. And I didn't know if that's part of the study or not. Yeah, so we've had, you know, the beginnings of those conversations. What would, you know, for instance, what would the middle school need to do? What would need to happen at the middle schools that are an appropriate site for an elementary school, and you know what would need to happen. So we've had. I some just of that I just want to know if it's part of the study. Yeah. That's because because it was literally a third point yeah. left off, yeah. and I want to know if it was potentially in. But Mr. Doni is the Mr. Minino. Uh, so just a, a quick comment, I think, about the earlier comment around uh, whether or not it was appropriate to consider the sixth grade um, thing. I mean, I, I just wanted to echo what Mr. Nakajima said about um, I think because we're looking at facilities use in space right now, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable having this conversation. I think when we come to the educational plan in the spring, we definitely want to have a joint meeting um, so that we can actually have that conversation without breaking open meeting law. Um, I guess my only question that I had, uh, thank you so much for the details with, uh, you know, with this presentation. Um, I, meant, I heard you mention a couple of different times that there were some wood shops and sort of unused or underutilized space 
that would be used potentially for other uh, things. And so that just made me think, you know, are we putting ourselves in a situation potentially with these either of these options or both of these options where we're not leaving any extra room for, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, maker space or whatever other. Like if we're utilizing every square inch of these buildings, are we kind of painting ourselves into a box inadvertently? Yep. Yeah, and I think maker space is a perfect example because it, it did come up several times over the last few weeks. Um, I think there's a desire to integrate spaces like that more into the academic side. Um, and currently the building is organized so that the wood shops are kind of off in the back mm -hmm. corner, out of the mainstream of circulation. <coughs> um, so there's, there's a very strong desire to integrate things like that into the academic side. Um, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that, uh, especially at the middle school level. Mm -hmm. um, the, the equipment that's associated with that um, could be located in a classroom within a team and any one of the middle school teams. Um, and, and I feel like there's enough space within the existing footprint to, to accommodate that. Okay. Yeah. One of the other comments had to do with project-based learning. Yeah. That's the trend and it requires different space needs. Mm -hmm. So that is part of the feedback loop that we're going to build, uh, layer onto the planning so as we go into the next renditions of the plans, that's integrated into the solution. Great. Yeah, just very briefly, I think the other challenge we have now of those spaces, in addition to the fact that they would need to be significantly upgraded, is they're, uh, if you've been to the middle school, they're on the LSSC side of the building, so students don't necessarily have access mm -hmm. even to get to the side of the building to use the spaces that are vacant. So I think, you know, just want to further that point, and one of the reasons we haven't put a significant amount of money into that is that it, it's literally in the part of the building that's not available to students without an adult swiping them all the way around and just the physical proximity or the lack of physical proximity to anything else they might use is, is a real challenge for us. Shmira? I s characterize this as a feasibility study and earlier you mentioned consensus. What kind of consensus are you talking about? Uh, about a feasibility study? Either it is or is not unless you're talking about opposition to moving the sixth grade. The reference was this is a facilities use study that may ultimately lead to a feasibility study. And the consensus is making sure that we have public participation in it's an open, transparent process so that we begin that conversation. And we're trying to lay a foundation for future conversations relative to the overall facilities here. So there's no, well, I, I can't help but assume there's an assumption behind the study because it says sixth grade. Uh, <laughs> So you've, made a, you've made a value judgment already. As one of the options, yeah. Well, I mean, I, my understanding of this work as we discussed it last year was that in order to have kind of a rational analysis and a public conversation, we were going to have to pose some scenarios, even if the scenarios could be more open-ended than not just binary, as we talked about earlier, not just 6, 7, 8, or 7, 8 to the high school. Um, but if I'm not wrong, it, that's where this comes from. And, it, and I think, Superintendent, you took pains to say more times than I can count last year mm -hmm. that this was not, this was precisely not trying to get a freight train running down a track toward anything. But that the, and if we didn't understand the actual capacities and configurations and any changes or upgrades that we needed to make to the building, then we couldn't even we'd be spinning our wheels if we then got into an educational programming conversation and, you know, demographic conversation because we'd say, all right, well, now we've decided we want to do it. Does anyone have any idea if these buildings could even be used in this way? And it's changing, it's turning it around the other way. And I just to, even though I posed or reinserted the third scenario, um, I think part of the value of the work is that if you get to door number three, your door number three, which is that seven and eight moved to the high school in the middle school, in fact, isn't used for any educational purpose, then there's intense interest on the part of the region of what do you do with this building and what is it good for, right? And so that so it, it's it's a valuable exercise. I just wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, th I think that was right. I did, you know, to answer your question very directly about consensus, what I think we're, tr what I feel like the district's trying to get out of it, and I think last Thursday was a good start, that we have an interested group of, uh, and diverse group of stakeholders who come to a agreement that we have a couple options that uh, people agree, you know, potentially could work, that we could bring to the community and the school committee to say, you know, these students can fit and this is the ramifications, that it's not a closed process where 
I work with a group of consultants to come up with something and say, like, where did that come from and why does it cost that much that it really is this interactive process. So it's not a consensus that the district should make a change, but it's a consensus that we have very realistic options and cost estimates that then can be considered by the committee mm -hmm. and, the, and the community to say, do we want to go further down this road that um, from the inception, community feedback has been a major part. And if you think about recent lessons learned from other projects that you may have been involved in, um, it isn't, it isn't, um, it's, it's, it's a learned experience to say that if you don't build a broad understanding and acceptance even of what are otherwise considered to be data or engineering or analysis, then people may not accept the conclusions of that data, that engineering, or that analysis. And so, as crazy as this may sound, especially in America of 2019, um, getting agreement on facts isn't actually a crazy, a crazy consensus to build, let alone an understanding of what those scenarios in fact are and what they entail. What I want to do right now is I want to run around the table and see if anyone has any additional questions because this is your first kickoff with us. It is not your last conversation with us. Um, and I think there are other points of entry, including through Ms. Kessenson, for, for the school committee to have input into this committee. Uh, and also, weirdly enough, we're on time, if you look at the schedule. <laughs> so I thought, why, why ruin things now? So I want to go around the table, starting here. Do you have anything else you want to ask? Well, just the next step. When do we discuss the wisdom of moving the sixth grade to the uh, out of the grade schools? So the, as, uh, as our team suggested that the reports due at the end of March and you know, that report would be brought back to this regional school committee to have that discussion. Um, so I do anticipate that this spring we would have active dialogue about the report itself and what the committees want to do to the earlier conversation. There's the potential to have joint meetings because it may free up conversation for elementary committee members and thinking also about Leverett and Shutesbury. So I'm not presupposing that, but I think that would be the reasonable timeline to have a more in-depth conversation of which. And that, and that, but that would be really about getting the facilities use study and then were that to launch a more in-depth effort, that would be a launch point for oh, more in-depth, right? Okay, so the point is there would not be a decision being made right. about this at that point. When do we get to express opposition to the movement. Uh, well, you can do that whenever you, uh, except for right this second, <laughs> that any time you want. Uh, and and uh, I, I'm sure no, that'll be part of the dialogue in March. Uh, I'm just saying it's not going to be conclusory. It's going to, you know, it'll be, it'll, next steps. it'll be whatever it is. Right. Mr. Um, uh One, just briefly, it would be great to have our facilities director involved in this as much as yeah. he possibly can, given all his other demands. Yeah. Um, and it's just general observation that, um, I mean, so one, I think you've done a great job at this level of detail in a short amount of time, so, so thank you. Um, it, I, I did find it surprising the, the level of addition that we would need, um, given that we've, the, the declining enrollment we've had at the high school and the, the original size that the high school was built for. It's something like 300 students we've decreased over the last 10 years, so I wasn't really expecting much of an addition, if at all, so to see this size I was just curious, Dr. Morrison, if, 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 if there was something explanatory in it for you that like, oh, it's just, it just these days we need more space per student or you know, what, what that is. Sure, I can just give you some of the factors. So Summit Academy being in the high school, while not that many students, is a pretty sizable amount of space. Uh, those years ago, we didn't have the Bright program. We didn't have a restorative practice program. We didn't have um, the PIP program that was four years ago. Um, now, that we expended yeah. the space, um, some of the specialized programs um, that uh, while they don't serve a tremendous number of, the quantity of students is great, the space needs of, of supporting those students is significant. So I think all of those factors really play into when you look at the square footage and look at the number of students, as kind of was shared earlier, um, we have so many more in-house special education and counseling supports for students that really require significant chunks of space, both at the middle school and high school, not just referring to the high school. Um, so that's why it's not the great overlay to look 20 years ago when we didn't have those other programs in place um, and, and, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't fit quite as neatly um, because our programming looks quite different. Thank you. Ms. McDonald? Um, one of my questions was, was um, about the shops, but also the, I wasn't really clear what you said about the science rooms in, in the middle school. If you could um, describe it, because I don't see science spelled out here, and I know that's a detail, yeah. but 
The science rooms are integrated into the team. So a, a typical seventh grade team <coughs> is made up of a math room, social studies, English, and a science. So it, it's better to have that integrated. So if you have a group of four, one of the four would be a science room. And at the middle school level, it, it's science light. Um, you know, we provide some sinks, uh, some demonstration tables, um, but it really doesn't have to be much bigger than a typical classroom. Um, and I think building in flexibility into mm -hmm. what is formerly known as a science room um, it is very advantageous. Mm -hmm. So you can do science in there, but you can do many other things in there mm -hmm. as well. Um, because there are programs that are up and coming that they're going to want to include and mainstream into the teams. Um, you know, you, you might want to have, have, you might want to call that a maker space. And there might be a cabinet with some equipment that you could pull out and put on a science table and use it as a maker space. So I think building in that flexibility into the rooms, um, I think will serve well for, for the mm -hmm. long term. And, and I take it that the, um, the front corner, um, I don't know what it is, the southwest corner of the building over on top of central office. That used to be science classrooms. I take it they still are laid out. Like they have, they have the oh, right. tables and the other stuff mm -hmm. the, yeah. of yeah. science rooms. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Dennis? Yeah, I just want to uh, reiterate again, I think that the level of detail that you've provided here is, is really great. Um, it helps us a lot, too, in conversations with the community to understand you know, the, the scheduled meetings, for example. I also really appreciate the care that you're taking to uh, walk through you know, a, a process um, with the community for getting that feedback. Um, you know, I think that uh, a lot of this will come down to how we talk about the facilities use study, because a lot of the folks in the community are hearing so many different initiatives that we have across the, the different districts. And we're soliciting a lot of community feedback at this point for all those different projects, which I'm sure you've heard about. And that can create a lot of confusion among community because they don't quite get what's happening when and why. They, they don't always even understand the differences in the school committees, right? It's, you know, it's just all one school committee. <coughs> so I think the more that we can communicate around that, um, and I think this is mostly for the superintendent, but also just as you will perceive in this project, um, the more that we communicate about the reasons for this facilities use study, the better off we all are, you know, further down the road. Uh, one <coughs> comment that I just, since you're collecting feedback, um, is that we, at the high school level, have a very uh, robust theater program, and a lot of it is not just contained in the, the you know, the, the auditorium anymore, right, and on the stage, it's all over the place, exactly. And so thinking about how that might impact, you know, any potential renovations or anything like that, creating additional, you know, speaker spaces, uh, you know, for uh, different types of audiovisual, you know, engagement <coughs> that the students, they've been cooking up these most amazing things, and a lot of it takes place in the hallways, in the cafeteria, you know, in the classrooms and different places like that. But I think if we're going to be taking a look at how to use space and if there's any potential pieces that, you know, that are added to the renovations or anything like that that can help enhance those experiences, I think we're all off better for it. So, yeah, okay. thank you. Ms. Uh, I don't have much to add. I just want to say thank you to Mr. Robert and Roberts and Hoagland. It's been, um, I've really enjoyed sitting in on the meetings, and I've been very impressed with their um, their professionalism and their dedication to this. I mean, they've been here a lot of hours so far, and we've had a lot of um, really productive meetings where I can tell they're listening and they're working hard to gather the information, um, and also with their creativity. I mean, I, I feel confident that, you know, if we were to pursue any of these options, there would be educational benefits um, to to our schools. So, um, yep, yeah, and just keep in touch with me. I mean, if you, anybody else has anything else you'd like me to bring, thank you. Great. Uh, what I was gonna, uh, you have something else you wanna say? Yeah, I think just if I could add one, yeah, I think sure. a brief comment to Mr. Menino's question about next steps. I think the other piece that uh, when this comes back to the committee, we also wanna share this back with the four towns. Mm -hmm. That, you know, some of the origin of people asking for this information wasn't just on the educational right. side. It was elected officials from the four communities. And, and on that note, I think an additional piece of study that if the committee wants to pursue this, particularly as a six, less so on the seventh through 12 model, but on the sixth grade model is what are the financial implications for the member towns? Uh, if one town or two towns or three towns or all four towns uh, suggest um, a desire to pursue having their sixth graders at the middle school, um, you know, 
it's something that Mr. Mangano and I have had initial conversations about. It's something that I think elected officials who, not just the ones here, but the ones who are in the Finance Committee select boards, uh, town councils may have some questions about. So that's another level of next step that I know other stakeholders will be expecting us to have information about, not at the end of this study, but certainly as that pursues. So I just, I don't want to leave that point out because I think it's an important point. I think that would be uh, desirable to do that if there's more involved from a cost perspective right. or a time perspective. It'd be nice to have that as an agenda on a future regional committee, uh, uh, you know, meeting so we can talk about it. Yeah. All right? I agree. Sabrina? Who decides that question as to whether to move the sixth grade from Pelham to the regional? I think as a practical matter, it's, it would have to be a combination of the regional school committee, perhaps even their member towns, and then also the Amherst School Committee in the town of Amherst. I mean, I think it would, there would there'd be multi, I think, am I wrong? I think there'd be multi-parties involved given the nature of the building. Yeah, so uh, just briefly, I had a conversation with um, someone who works at MARS, which is the Massachusetts Association of Regional Schools. And, you know, this is not the first time that some districts have explored this, and there's two ways districts have managed it. One is to amend the regional agreement, which would require the um, votes of all four communities. And sometimes there's memorandums of agreements that are passed um, that, you know, don't involve full um, changing of the regional agreement because some communities don't want to open up the regional mm -hmm. agreement for a whole host of reasons, uh, but that get added. So um, she was able to share, Barbara Ripa was able to share multiple models uh, for how this might work, uh, but I think to your point, it wouldn't just be the regional school committee. I agree with the, what uh, Mr. Nakajima said, what the chair said. It would have to be multiple um, bodies. Yeah. For example, in Pelham, it would be the Pelham Town Meeting. Well, it could work. I mean, let's. I got an idea. Why don't we get back to you? Yeah. I mean, in all seriousness, because you're asking a serious question, and I think it requires a legally vetted answer <laughs> rather than winging it. Clearly, there would have to be entity, you know, duly authorized entities on the part of the town of Pelham that would have to act on this. I want to move on, but Mr. Dilling? Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that because I think when Mr. Menino asked about Pelham, you had said the Amherst School Committee would be voting, and I think you just misspoke and you meant to say the Pelham School Committee. No, I meant the Amherst School Committee. Would, I mean, if it would, would not be voting on Pelham. No, not kids, Pelham. That's what I mean. It, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking of, well, both. <laughs> Pelham School Committee. See, I no, retract no, no, no. a question. No, 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 no. no that's a, that's a, uh, for, forgive me, I was, I was giving you an extraordinarily Amherst-centric answer. Uh, because I don't, I, I mean, to be honest with you, theoretically, the Amherst School Committee, um, which has been talking about this more than the Pelham School Committee, maybe, um, could actually vote to move their sixth, sixth grade, hypothetically, to the, to the middle school, and the Pelham School Committee could choose not to. And then your school, your sixth grade, for those, you know, for people who are watching, would, you know, th those are separate decisions, at least at the moment. And if they ever are not, we'll bring up some other committee that can talk to us about <laughs> what would happen there. Uh, I was also going to say, uh, I'm not trying to be facetious. I mean, it, these, it is really that complicated, as crazy as it is. Um, Mr. Ms. Kastensen, what I was going to say is uh, it would be great if during our subcommittee updates and future meetings, mm -hmm. that this item, I mean, sort of keep in mind that I'm going to look toward you. Absolutely. And I'll be staring. <laughs> and you'll be like, you're making me uncomfortable. Why are you staring at me? And it's going to be because I want you to talk about the facility use study and see how it's going. Sure. All right? You got it. That sounds awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hope the snow is not too bad out there. Yeah, Safe you. travels. We are now safely no longer ahead of time, by the way. Uh, but we're doing well. Second quarter budget update. Uh, Sean, Mr. McGonagall. Thank you. So it should be in your packets, the second quarter report. After six months, the Amherst Pelham Regional School District budget is projected to finish under budget due to savings in tuitions and health insurance. Um, payroll is tracking over budget by 96000 due to a, a few things, which are listed below. Um, I won't spend too much time on them because most of them are the same as last time. Um, if you go to the <coughs> one thing I will just say on, on the payroll section is we have had quite a bit of staff turnover this year, um, most of which you know about. So we've had a domino effect with like the high school principal retiring, and then there's uh, assistant principal has stepped into that, and then a new person stepped into that. So some of the savings that you're seeing, or some of the overage in payroll or, or savings in payroll, um, is related to that domino effect of people changing positions. Hold on. 
You just simultaneously said underage and overage. Can you just right. clarify? And sure. So, you, so we have ninety six thousand over budget. So and that's why don't I just go through it? It'll be it'll be easier to start from the beginning <laughs> because there's a lot of pieces here. So ninety six thousand over budget. Um, middle school principal model was twenty eight thousand more expensive than we originally anticipated. We had the, uh, just one principal and assistant principal, okay. and having the, the dual principal model. Um, business office and HR staffing is twenty seven thousand higher than anticipated. Um, that's due to the health insurance trust fund going away. That supported a portion of salaries in the business office and, and HR. Um, that that's gone. Um, additional ELL support, uh, 0.15 FTE, totaling 10,000. In special education, uh, 109,000 over budget due to a couple things. The first piece is actually a savings. Um, we have a few unfilled positions um, that we've been trying to fill, just haven't been able to fill those positions because they're very um, specialized positions. So we've tried to, some the, the payroll piece is unfilled. We've contracted out what we have, have had to do um, from the uh, expense side, um, like the BCBA work um, and some of the psychology work. Um, but on the payroll side, those positions are still unfilled. Um, we shifted $200,000 of employee salaries off the IDA grant um, and onto the general fund. So what that looks like <coughs> is an increase in payroll because these salaries are no longer being paid by the IDA grant. Um, instead, we're paying tuitions off the IDA grant, and that was a, a budget move we made um, during the budget process to try to actually get more out of the IDA grant than we have in the past. Um, and then we also have three additional paraeducators at Summit Academy for a total of $50,000. Staff turnover savings, so that's savings, the staff turnover piece, um, is driven by staffing pattern changes and some of the turnover we've seen. Um, and I just gave a couple examples, the one being the high school principal. Um, and we have a few leave of absences too for staff that the position's open, we've had to hire temporary staff to fill that position, um, and the temporary staff come out of the contract section, not the payroll yeah. section, so that's a savings. Any questions on the payroll section for it? Okay. Um, yes, Mr. Reyes. Yes. Sorry, Sean. It's okay. No, it's okay. Um, it was confusing. I apologize. <laughs> so um, I'm a little I'm a little confused about the middle school principal model mm -hmm. being twenty eight thousand more than anticipated. Sure. I rem if I remember correctly, when we decided to go with that model, it was said to the committee at the time that the costs. Uh, basically the, the transferring of administrators within the middle school would actually kind of more or less break even. I don't think we ever heard that it was going to be this much more. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did this come about? Sure. Yeah. So I think two things happen. One is that, you know, we based on uh, what we think um, contracts will come out to and that based on experience. And so um, sometimes we have to make adjustments to how much people are will get paid in addition to what we slot based on the experience they come with. So some of it's based on the experience that the two people came with. I think the other piece is we decided to increase, um, in the old model, the assistant principal at the middle school was only a school year position. Yeah. Uh, given the needs of the middle school, we made the decision to have both principals be present in the summer. And so that increased the cost, but we felt like it fit the need that the community had for um, stability and to start the year off the way we wanted to start it. If I can yep, just, um, sure. so it totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think, though, for future conversations mm -hmm. around these kinds of mm -hmm. staffing changes, it would be helpful to hear, you know, if, if at all being able to forecast mm -hmm. uh, this, we, we're not sure, you know, sure. because it, it really does create a false sense of security about, yeah. you know, what we expect the cost to be. Um, and I'll say also that I think that there are community members who are paying very close attention to, mm -hmm. you know, how we are hiring administrators in our schools. And so this sets off a flag um, right. mm -hmm. to say that we are, you know, promising extra money or doing, you know. Uh, so it, it just doesn't sit right with a lot of community members. So I, I really would appreciate, I think, in the future hearing, you know, we're, we're unsure or there may be some changes based on the information that you just gave, which again is completely, you know, yeah, makes definitely. perfect sense. Mm -hmm. um, but this definitely caught my attention. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a high enough, this is potentially a salary for another person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, just looking to next year, we have projected the same model for next year, so it's built into the FY20 budget at this point. That's good. Yep. Thank you. So you were saying, so is, uh, were you saying something about enrollments in charter schools? I think that'll be more in that for you. It's on your, it's on your thingy yeah. here. Yes. Yeah. So um, one, 
One second. <laughs> um, so in expense accounts, um, special education is tracking higher than expected. Um, we shifted that $200,000 of grant funds from payroll to um, tuitions. So we would think we would see like a $200,000 savings in tuitions, um, but we've had more out-of-district placements than we were expecting going into the year. Um, so special education costs are actually tracking higher than expected. Um, going to enrollments. Uh, enrollments in charter schools, vocational schools, and other public schools are much lower than expected. Um, you can see the charts below. What I've given you for each category is the FY18 um, either actual enrollment or the um, Q2 enrollment, whatever we had sort of when we were doing the budget. Um, what we then budgeted for FY19 based on that information, and then what the current enrollment looks like either uh, based on that FY19 Q2 information. So for charter school, you can see we had 93 last year, or in FY18, a Q2. Our projection method was pretty simple for that. It was sort of rolling it down a grade and then looking at what our average has been um, coming into seventh grade. Um, however, as you can see, what we're actually looking at is many fewer students, 12 fewer students than what we were expecting. Um, and it's not all at the seventh grade level like you might expect. We've actually had you know, quite a few in ninth grade, which that sort of makes sense coming to the high school, you can expect, but we also had quite a few in other grades as well. Um, students either come back to us or leave the move out of town so they're not our students anymore. So one, one question you can probably anticipate later on the budget mm -hmm. is just um, how are we sort of prudently or conservatively projecting into the next year's budget? Because I'd much rather have you next, next January say, hey, look, there were fewer in than we thought, yeah. than, oh, crap, we had a minor trend that was favorable and now it reversed itself right. and we're in yep. tough trip. You know, yep. you can figure that out. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think we are starting to see the harder part is trying to build in or consider that some of the trend is students coming back to us in ninth grade. Yeah. Um, and it's not every year, but I think there's some years where we have seen it. So that's a hard part in terms of the projecting. Sure. Um, because it's such a personal decision for students. Um, vocational, again, we had this another really um, sort of positive year in terms of students coming back to us. So in FY17, we had roughly 50 students. That dropped down to about 40 for FY18. And now for FY19, it's dropped down to 31.5. So it's pretty low relative uh, to what we've had in the past five, five to 10 years, um, 7.5 less than what we budgeted. Um, and most of that is, is in the ninth grade level. You can see we budgeted 12. We only had seven ninth graders. Um, the average has been around 13, so we have fewer seventh graders uh, or ninth graders go out to vocational schools. Choice enrollment, again, the pattern just continues. Um, projected, we had 24 last year, we projected 24 this year, um, and we have 18. And again, that's sort of spread out across many grades. So, all together, though, the savings from all the tuitions, um, from all the tuitions coming back in was about $343,000, mm -hmm. so it's a really large number, which is good in some ways and things we have to think about in other ways in terms of planning for next year. Um, utilities are tracking under budget, uh, but this area will shift as the weather gets really cold, like it's supposed to on Thursday. Um, risk and benefits are tracking significantly under budget due to some changes that you've heard about. Um, in particular, we have fewer, many fewer plans in the region, unlike Amherst where we had a little drop in plans, uh, and the number of plans in region, we actually have a pretty significant drop in the number of health insurance plans. Um, you can see the chart below, we had 249 last October, um, we have 229 this October, so um, a drop of 20 plans one year to the next. Um, some of those are opt-outs, we have an opt-out program, so um, an employee can choose to take their spouse's insurance and we pay them an incentive to do so. Um, that definitely went up, but it doesn't account for all of the, all of the change. Um, we also had a shift from PPOs to HMOs, which has financial savings, um, and then the surcharge going away halfway through the year was another big one. So the surcharge was roughly 11% of the total premium. Um, so you can imagine that's a pretty big chunk to go away halfway through the year. Um, we were also able to lower our liability insurance. We did a competitive quote process over the summer, um, so that lowered our building liability insurance by 22,000. Um, and our unemployment insurance costs are tracking 45,000 under budget. Um, given the nature of last year's budget process, we expected the unemployment insurance cost to be higher than average. Um, and it's actually tracking the other way, which is a bit of a surprise. So at the midway point in the year, the district is on track with expected savings and tuitions and health insurances. Um, and as the year progresses, uh, more information will become available and we'll update the projections. Um, the last piece of this is just the revenue side. Um, revenues are mostly coming in on track. 
also Chapter 70 uh, brought in a little bit more than we projected. Charter is coming in less, but it's driven by the enrollment coming in lower. That's uh, the reimbursement's a function of that. Um, Transportation is coming in a little bit higher because they increased the reimbursement rate after the budget was finalized. There was a lot of advocacy to increase the regional transportation reimbursement last year. Um, and that's some minor fluctuations below. But overall, revenues are on track. Any questions? Q2 budget report. Was the 343 in the savings mentioned a moment ago net of uh, the reduction in Chuck? Charter tuition reimbursement, or no, it's, it's just a separate. On the, that's not just on the expense line, side. And you yeah. have a revenue line. If you wanted to okay. net it out, you'd subtract the seventy-four from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that would make sense. Okay, let us roll into the next section of our. our, our what? Can I add one other positive thing? I wanted to see if there's. You, you had a question you wanted us to ask. No, I wanted you? to. I wanted to pose something we're considering doing and okay. look for confirmation. Um, so because the budget's in good shape, um, and we've heard a lot about our facility needs, one of the things we're considering doing with um, some of the, the savings is refurbishing the seats in the auditoriums, um, both of them, the high school and the middle school auditorium. Um, we've got a proposal from the Mass Department of Corrections, who they do this, um, <coughs> to come during breaks. They will take the seats out, um, not inmates. The the staff that would come to, um, well, some schools some do that, but our, we pose, could we do it without? So um, it'll be their staff that do that. They'll bring it back. Um, the inmates do the refurbishing. Um, it's a sort of a work skills program where they teach, they just, they train them. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a lower cost for us and has a benefit for them as well. Um, it would be interagency in terms of two state agent or two state um, entities. Um, and then they would come and reinstall them. Um, we worked out a tentative schedule with the theater departments to see if it could work because there's a lot of performances, and so um, it'd probably have to be done in a couple phases. Um, but I think if you've seen the condition of our auditorium seats, particularly at the middle school, but also at the high school, um, it's long overdue. Um, it was on our capital plan, so it's another way of lightening some of the capital plan in the future, um, and it could be done before June 30th, which is, it would have to be in order to use the funds this Can you year. Can vote for this in a future meeting? You don't have to vote for it. Um, you could. Could choose to if you'd like to. Um. I think it'd make more sense to okay. have a vote on it. Sure. Um, I mean, obviously, assuming it doesn't, I guess under, we didn't hear of any potential scenarios around building use in which you don't want to have new auditorium seats. Right. Refurbished. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, no, but I mean, that's not funny about this, yeah. but like, there's nothing mm -hmm. happening there. I guess the grade, we, are, we know that the grade at the middle school auditorium isn't what it should be. Mm -hmm. But if that was redone, presumably you can unbolt the seats, regrade it, and put the seats back down. Right. So, and honestly, I think if you want to get, I'm not that you're looking for cheers, sure. but if you're looking for cheers from the public, uh, this would be one thing that would get cheers. Yeah, it seemed to fit with what we've heard, both from Mr. Bechtold and just others that, you know, mm -hmm. and, the, and the community would benefit too, because there's obviously lots of community events um, that use the seats. So why don't we, why don't we revisit that? Okay. I mean, bring it forward yeah. at another yeah. meeting. And I think if I could just add yeah. to, just very briefly, I think one of the things that we're looking at, why we pick that as compared to some of the other things that were on the capital plan that are deferred is it's something that we can get done before June 30th, right? So yeah. it's, it's, it's important. I, th I agree with everything that was stated. As opposed to some work that would involve intensive design that would take months and procurement that would take yeah. months, uh, we're saying, you know, if we're in an advantageous year, what can we get done that we actually can functionally get done that would have an impact on student experience in the community? So I just want to, because a legitimate question could be, and it could be for a future meeting, why this and not that, and, and that's a major factor. I think I think you should still anticipate at the future meeting yeah. listing what you think you could have done that we're not choosing to do. Yeah. So we can just answer that question before you're asked it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Mr. Demling. Um, back on the revenue summary for the Q2 update, um, does, does Circuit Breaker not get called out as a specific? It's not, um, I'm just trying to understand yeah. exactly the order of magnitude and how that impacts us. And yeah. So it's not a, these are general fund revenues, mm -hmm. so these are the revenues that would support the overall budget that you vote. Circuit Breaker, by statute, is a separate um, revenue source, so it has a separate fund. Um, so it's just not part of this. Yeah. Does but it's it about $500,000 for the region. Okay, does that, does that pay some of the uh, additional out-of-district expenses that mm -hmm. you were yeah, we, identifying in the expense yeah. accounts? I'm just trying to understand, like, you know, what... what, what how big is that cost growing? And given that it's underfunded, one of the many underfunded mandates by the state, and in the governor's budget, yeah. um, you know what potential impact that should have for our budget planning and for advocacy? Yeah, um, it's a it's a large piece. There's actually a chart. I'll try to 
give you the page, there's a chart in the information section of the budget mm -hmm. that has out-of-district tuitions, mm -hmm. and it breaks it down into funding source. So it shows general fund, circuit breaker, um, now it'll include IDA, um, and it'll, so it'll give you that sense of what por portion, but it's a pretty big chunk of our tuitions is paid by circuit breaker. Thank you. I'm moving on. I'm not going to look around. I'm not going to see if anyone has their hands up. We're going to move forward. We're now well behind our published agenda, <laughs> by the way, if anyone's curious. But I mean, all useful stuff, so I'm not criticizing my questions or yours. <laughs> Dude, keep rolling. Okay. Actually, sorry. Um, all right. So this is the FY20. I'll points. take a book, by the way. I don't want to. I don't want one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We've got Chromebooks. <laughs> right here. There it is. Set up for it. <laughs> Why do you look upset? <laughs> sorry to ask. Why do? Why do I need two things to look at? No, this is okay. this. See this big binder? Oh, yeah. The whole the oh. whole thing is gonna is now in that device. Are we sharing or is this mine? That's yours. Oh. Keep, <laughs> take good care of it, or uh, Mr. Champagne will be upset. Um, so I just gave you a Chromebook. You can use it if you want. If you don't want, you can give it back to me. Um, it's a way of replacing <coughs> these big binders. Um, the main benefit, from my standpoint, is we have many updates throughout the budget process, and if you do the binders, I have to bring like whole punch pages with little red update tags at the bottom and you have to like stick them in if you do. Um, <laughs> and so doing it electronically, at least until the end, um, seems to make sense because I can just give you an updated version. Um, okay, and I can still highlight for you what's changed, but you don't have to. Okay, just hand me the thing. You want to give it back to me? Yeah, just hand me the thing. Oh, you didn't I take feel one? appropriately shamed. <laughs> so if, if we forgot our iPads from last week at home, the, this budget that was pushed to those iPads, Yes. Okay. Oh wait, that's the one I'd already have at home. Yes. It's already pushed to it. Yep. Oh, then give me the binder back. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the other nice thing. If you want to use this for other agenda items, um, he can, uh, Mr. Champagne can push anything to it, and it just shows up in the that left hand side. And you just click on it, and it pulls up. Cool. All right. So, getting into this budget highlight. So the proposed FY20 budget uh, maintains. All the things that you see there, things that the district values, um, has valued uh, over the past. Um, the proposed budget is $32,230,193, which is a 1.3% increase um, over the prior year budget. And that budget includes $57,100 of net additions. Um, so we'll talk about this when we get into the assessment. There was sort of a commitment by the towns to fund level services. Um, there are because of the nature of this year's budget, we may need to propose some additions and level <coughs> services as, um, happens to be coming in lower this year than usual. So this budget is based on a 30% uh, statutory assessment method. Um, there's the advisory group that's meeting to discuss assessment method options. Um, they haven't, we haven't zeroed in on a method that feel confident enough to project here yet. So we used put forward a method that could potentially be a fallback option. Um, this method has some potential because last year we did this method but with 20%, so it increases the percentage a little bit, so it's consistent with trying to factor in more wealth into the assessment method, which satisfies one town's um, interests in particular. Um, it also sort of, from a DESE standpoint, it's consistent with the method we used last year, so it wouldn't be a, a huge shift for them to consider this method um, for FY20. Um, and it also, and more importantly, actually, this method we consider this method because it produces assessments that are reasonable for each town, um, from at least my perspective, reasonable for each town. Um, so again, it's a method that could work for next year. Um, the level services, 1.3 percent, uh, driven by a lot of things. A lot of things you'll see here are similar to the Q2 report. Um, they're just projected forward one more year. So positive uh, level services budget because of out of district tuitions and because of health insurances, um, and that IDA shift that I was talking about. So that was a shift between payroll and expense. Um, this is a more global shift. So we have a large IDA grant that supports all three districts. Um, in the past, it's funded the elementary schools more heavily. Um, we're trying to get that corrected to be more uh, equal to like enrollment or proportional to enrollment. Um, we've just been trying to wait for a year that all three districts it could work. So it wasn't uh, really hurting one district financially to do it. 
um, and this is the year where it seems to be a good time for all three districts to try to get that lined up correctly. This is just a graphic view of level services and the changes to level services. So wages and staffing are going up about $420,000. Um, special education, tuitions, uh, including transportation, going up a little over $200,000. Other programs, which is where Charter Choice and Vocational are located, going down uh, about 180000 Our pension liability usually grows somewhere between fifteen and 100000 each year, and it's continuing to do so. Uh, health insurance, obviously, is the really big one, going down uh, over about 420000 Important to note, this health insurance savings is based on the 6% increase um, to health insurance. We haven't built in the actual increase that we just received. Um, so that number is going to improve the next time you see this information. It'll improve, it'll get even better. Um, and then all the other costs are going up about 200, 250,000. Some of those other costs are the substitutes, um, food services, uh, some contingencies and control accounts that were cut last year that we're putting back in place as a, as a, as a uh, safety net. Uh, budget calendar. So tonight we're meeting to present the budget. Um, so the timeline's a little funky this year. So we try to get you the detailed ads and cuts a week before the budget hearing so that you have time to go over it. And we also try to present, uh, post it online so the community can see it. Um, so if we follow that week schedule, we will we'll get you the detailed ads and cuts um, next week. So <laughs> which is, we're pretty much in, in position to do that. It might be a little bit after that. We'll see how that goes. Um, but it'll, you'll get it in advance so that you can go through it before the meeting. Um, we'll have the public hearing on the 12th. Uh, the four town meeting hasn't been scheduled yet, but somewhere between the 12th and when we vote the budget, we'll have some sort of coming back together of the four towns. Um, and then the vote by the regional school committee would be the 26th. Or there's another meeting earlier. I don't know if it's set yet, whether it be the 26th or the earlier meeting. March um, 12th is the earlier meeting. Early, yeah. Um, and so the capital plan would sort of follow the same process. So you vote on ca the capital plan at the whatever meeting you vote the budget. Um, at the Amherst level, I gave sort of additional details in terms of how the new town council will work um, in terms of timing. That's mostly all the same. There's a little wrinkle with um, region capital. So the regional agreement says that the towns will consider the debt authorization by the school committee within 60 days of that authorization. Mm -hmm. So if you approve the debt authorization on the 26th, which is sort of the typical process, um, town council would have to consider that probably within 60 days, which is a little bit different from their schedule that they're considering everything else. So I've made the town aware. We're going to probably have to look into that a little bit more in terms of timing. Um, but it's a little wrinkle that I think is unique to the region. So um, for those people who don't live in Amherst? Nothing um, will change. <laughs> well, no, but they shouldn't they be aware yeah. that this year the Amherst Town Council would be approving their portion of the budget mm -hmm. later? Right. So if... I'm just saying a couple of people yeah, were yeah, at those yeah. meetings. I yeah, guess. if that... So because of the, t the switch to Town Council, if they consider the regional assessment the same way they consider everything else, right, it'll be... They'll be considering it much later than they have in the past. Um, their process... The way their process is laid out in their charter, if they stick, you know, to the every date... Um, they would be approving their regional assessment somewhere between June 1st and June 30th. Um, in the past, it's usually in May, mm -hmm. um, late May, but sometime in May. So, so it puts a fine point on whatever agreement we think we have, uh, we better really have. Because mm -hmm. it's not just going to be bad for the school, regional school district and committee or whatever, but also for your towns, uh, it would be disruptive. Just Not to a, say that'll happen. No, no, I'm right. just saying it's yeah, and it's just a different it's a dynamic. It's a wrinkle. Yeah, going through a town council as opposed to a town meeting. Yeah. Okay. So budget process. Um, we've gathered all the input from principals and directors, and we continue to, to gather input. Um, we've started doing the budget guidance process with you all. Um, budget presentation tonight. Budget hearing in a couple of weeks, and the school committee vote at 12th or 26th. Um, we also have a. Uh, meeting scheduled next week with staff to go over some of the budget information and, and hear their questions and concerns. Um, we're scheduling some meetings with the PGO, the, the CPAC um, as well to try to get input on the budget, see what their thoughts are. So is it the 12th or the 13th? Sorry. <laughs> Maybe someone can clarify. 12th. 12th. Sorry. Typo. 12th. Sorry. It's okay. Um, so revenue budget. So we've 
FY19 is the current budget that's been approved. FY20 is what we're proposing. So I might talk about the, the charter piece that Dr. Morris mentioned earlier on this page. So we're projecting a $25 per pupil increase for Chapter 70. That's $5 more than what the governor's budget included. His was $20 per pupil. Um, we'll have to see how the next version of the budget comes out. Hopefully that will be increased, so this will be on track. Um, it's not a huge difference, but the $5, but um, right now we're a little bit above the governor's budget. Um, transportation reimbursement is more in line with what we're receiving for FY19, and it's based on sort of level funding of transportation aid. Medicare Part D, uh, Medica Medicaid reimbursement is just based on what we expect to get this year, so we're increasing it a little bit. Um, Medicare Part D went away, so one of the reasons our health insurance numbers are coming in better is because this Medicare Part D reimbursement that we used to get as a subsidy when we were fully insured is now applied directly to our retiree rates. Um, now that we're with Maya, that's how they do it. So um, you just said for transportation reimbursement, you're showing a modest increase. Mm -hmm. I, thought the, I thought the governor's budget level funded. It did. So our estimate for FY, um, if you go back to the Q4 report or the Q2 report, yeah. you'll see that what we budgeted for our transportation reimbursement, we're actually supposed to get more than that. Okay. So this is acknowledging that we under budgeted for FY19, so we're correcting it for FY20. So we're projecting level funding in terms of the reimbursement rate. Might be helpful. Can I try to? Yeah, go ahead. So when the budget was passed last year, yeah. we were anticipating a lower, uh, a significantly lower number of transportation reimbursement because there was so much advocacy, both, you know, in yeah. this committee. Was, so the real number is higher than what was budgeted. Okay. So um, the 720 that was budgeted for, and the, what's the real number? So the real number um, from the actual is about 770,000. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So you're going to roll that forward or something? Yeah, so the 760 is acknowledging that it should be higher than the 720 going forward. So these are all budgeted numbers, so the numbers in the past are not Oh, actually, I'm sorry. So, yeah. so forgive me. I, I'm sorry to be thick. but um, no, it's okay. So you're just saying that if it is level funded this year, level funded would be 760 because the base yeah. they're operating off is the 770 from last year, our right. share 770 from last year, not 720. Yep. And then you're, you're taking into account inflation and saying, well, it isn't really going to be 770. It's going to be a knockoff of that. Yeah. So we'll say it's 760. Yeah, we try to be a little conservative on it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so Medicare Part D, that's folded into our rates, so that's no longer a revenue source, but it does make our retiree health insurance rates lower. Um, charter reimbursement, so this is 205 here um, based on the formula that was in place for this year. Um, the next time I present this to you, it'll probably be 90, 80 or 90,000. It's gonna go down quite a bit um, based on the information I sort of figured out today just by probing. Um, so the, the new formula, should I go into a little bit? So the, so the new, the old formula, they looked at your, this year's uh, tuition compared to last year's tuition. If it went up, they reimbursed you a percentage of that difference. Um, they didn't look at number of students or anything like that. It was just looking at the actual tuition that you're paying. Um, the new formula, I'm not going to have it exact, but it's much more seems much more complicated than that. So what they look at is your current year's enrollment for charter school, for charter schools. They look at your last five years of enrollment, and they look to see is your current year enrollment higher than any of uh, is higher than any of those prior five years. If any of those prior five years are higher, then they don't give you any reimbursement because they don't don't look at it as true growth. As I think sort of what, where they're going. Um, but if your current year is higher than any of your prior five years, they'll give you some transitional aid. So it's basically taking that trend. Don't you're gonna get mad. I no, I'm, well, I'm mad not at you. <laughs> I know. Uh, so the transitional aid that you kind of get to smooth out the increases in your yeah. tuition, you know. So this, you know, when you look at the numbers that they're using, we're going up about $140,000 in tuition from FY19 to FY20. Yeah. But because our enrollment had that dip in FY. Um, from FY18 to FY19, FY20 is actually higher, so we're not actually getting any transitional assistance for that 140,000 that our tuition is actually going up. Um, so they're not looking at inflation of the tuition rate. That's not really being counted. It's really just looking at enrollment to be the the mechanic for whether you get a, a reimbursement or not. Okay. Is this this is the proposed governor's, the governor's yeah. proposed. Yeah. So obviously the point is there's advocacy around changing mm -hmm. that and seeing how it comes out in the wash later. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so I was going to ask you if you could take what you sort of just described and maybe I don't, send that off in a, a one paragraph description, yeah. maybe to, yeah. <laughs> uh, to, to us. Um, just because, so this is a weird year for education advocacy at the state level, right? Because Fund Our Future and the Foundation Budget 
is rightfully getting the attention it deserves to overcome it, um, the, the fallacies, fallacies in that. But there's a, you know, a, another, a, a number of other line items that have a real danger of getting overlooked in this, and, you know, and the governor's budget has several prime examples of this, yep. prime examples including this, you know, also regional transportation and circuit breaker yep. and all that. So um, as we're trying to get the, you know, the limited amount of attention of our, of our legislatures and getting them to pay attention to specific, specific things, um, so that they don't overlook this, um, that would be good. That would be good to yeah. have. Yeah. Um, and, and the other so, sort of, you know, th just from my just year and a half of <laughs> advocacy, the, the governor's budget. I mean, we do have to sort of remember. So it's good to budget conservatively, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it is he's re he's of one party, and the other party controls the house and the senate. Mm -hmm. So without making any personal opinionating about the goodness or badness of the parties, the fact of the matter is, is that it's kind of like his values document, right. and it every year gets substantially changed. So, you know, hopefully it gets improved about what gets from this worst case scenario. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, you're, you're, you're good to be budgeting conservatively. The, the funny thing about it is that even before when you had one party control of the state government, um, it, it might have worked the same way. <laughs> that the governor puts the word their value statement and then the House and Senate just change it anyway. Uh, I mean, so I think, I think there's, there's interesting, there's like two dynamics involved. One, whatever his ideological bias is, and then, or practical bias. Then the second one is that the House and Senate always screw with whatever the governor proposes. And, and in fact, the budget documents are always put forward knowing that. And so sometimes line items are purposefully put at a certain level because they know that there might be an item that DeLeo really cares about or something or whatever the issue is. And they'll, they'll precisely lowball it knowing that the speaker will have to increase it later. And the House and Senate, as you know, do the same, same thing. One of the things that we talked about in that regional assessment group the other day is the, is the I think, fact that the, for us, for our, if we are concerned about our own bottom line, um, and it doesn't mean, as you're suggesting, Mr. Dumling, doesn't mean we don't care about other school districts, what happens in other parts of the state. We could be very supportive of that, and I think we should be, but that if we're really concerned about uh, ameliorating the negative fiscal effects on our own district, the line items are regional transportation, circuit breaker, charter. the charter reimbursement formula and funding level. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yep. And and that may not be on the radar screen right now. And I think if our towns, among others, don't put it on it, um, we could be in trouble. We could be in real trouble. Yep. Anything on this? Well, let's keep Any rolling. Questions? Okay. Um, so the assessments are the next piece. So you can see um, when I talked about the assessments being reasonable, um, this is what the 30% method would produce. So Amherst is 3.14, that's probably the toughest one here. I mean, when we looked at a range of assessments, most of the time Amherst is between three and 3.5%. So it's not this particular assessment method that's making them higher, it's just based on the factors in Amherst of EQV shifting upward and their enrollment is growing, that they tend to be a higher, <coughs> higher share, higher increase this year. Um, Pelham is going down, that's pretty consistent among all the options we've looked at. Um, Leverett is going up 1.46%, which is within the guidance we received from Leverett of 1.5%. And Shootsbury is going down 1.8%, uh, which is within their guidance, and I think it's consistent with what some of the members have been looking for, which is to get uh, factoring the wealth, which should decrease their assessment. And this already includes the increased <coughs> minimum? The changes budget. in minimum, yeah. 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 Okay, for Leverett? Yeah, for all of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and then reserves, so because, again, because of the advantageous savings that we have this year because of health insurance and tuitions, we're proposing increasing uh, E&D for budget support a little bit to 600000 um, from 500000 um, It's not, it's been there before, you can't see it on the screen, but it's been as high as six, it's been higher than 600000 in the past. Um, the contingency for E&D would still stay 280. we don't usually touch that um, unless there's an emergency. Um, and then the, the piece below that was sort of a temporary thing. Uh, interest revenue is the last piece, so the total budget would be the thirty-two million two hundred thirty thousand one ninety-three, uh, one point three percent increase. Questions? Okay. Um, this sort of summarizes um, what Mr. Nakajima and you know we've all been discussing about the advisory group that's been looking at different options. There is a lot of positive momentum, it seems like, and goodwill, and um, we are looking at some things that are a little bit different than we've looked at in the past in terms of trying to control the volatility of assessment changes, which is usually what spurs a disagreement over the assessment. Um, so we're taking a little bit of a different approach at looking at it, which is 
hopeful. Which, is, um, which really just involves floors and ceilings. Yeah. That you might say, for example, that no town's assessment will drop more than 1%, but no town's assessment will increase more than 4% right. in any given year. Uh, and then there's various ways of apportioning the reductions amongst yeah. the other towns. And I think it's, so we're meeting next week. We'll have more information um, if if we're going to try something different than the thirty percent method. Um, we should know after next week's meeting. Uh, so this is the expense budget, very high level. Um, so highlights: salaries are up two point five five percent. It's just a combination of steps, colas, um, retirements, some other staff turnover pieces. Um, substitutes are up twenty two thousand four ninety one. We have sort of a series of rate increases expected for substitutes because of the minimum wage going up. Um, to $15 over the next few years, so we're sort of stick, keeping pace with that. Uh, expense accounts are down 93841 um, comprised of a few factors. The first one I mentioned, special education, is actually up um, due to some additional out-of-district placements. We went from about 15 out-of-district placements um, a couple of years ago. We have 20 this year, and we're projecting 20 again next year. Uh, other programs are down 172750 due to the lower um, out-of-district enrollment for Charter Choice and Voc. Those little charts below show each of those different categories. So charters, the trend is still up, but you can see it's flattening out um, compared to the last couple of years where it was really a steep increase. Um, vocational has dropped significantly, and choice has, has dropped as well. So all the, most, for the most part, they're all moving in the direction we would hope. Health insurance is the big one, down 431000 uh, due to the changes that I mentioned before. Um, just a similar chart that you saw in the Q2 report in terms of what we had last year, what we projected for um, FY19, and what we're projecting for next year. These are a couple of trend charts that are in the budget uh, document for all the departments that I just pull out, a couple of the interesting ones. This is classroom support spending. This includes the writing center at the um, high school, which is pretty popular um, and helps support students after school. Um, recently, they were able to increase the FTE of that writing center. This is library spending. Looks sort of looks funny, but it's mostly driven by staff turnover. So as you you had a presentation from Miss uh, Lamison, she retired, and so we have a different librarian. So it's um, the overall staffing level has stayed consistent, but you can see what staff turnover does to um, the cost. And just just to put a fine point on it, if anyone's looking at this at home, you're projecting out a couple of years, mm -hmm. and so it's not that we went down l last year and we're going up right now steeply, right. this is actually the bottom of the trough, right. as you put it. Yeah, yeah. we just we include a couple of projection years just to show you what it would look like if, if we keep the same staffing model, but we make some estimates about uh, steps and colas, what would the cost look like in the future? So yeah. you'll see that sort of uh, direction in most of the charts. Um, so additions and reductions are not the detailed ones that you'll get next week. Um, it's very high level, but we have $68,000 of adjustments proposed, uh, $326,700 of additions proposed, and $201,600 of reductions. Um, the net increase is $57,100, um, which includes 4.85 staff. And you'll get much more detail uh, next week. Capital and debt. So the, the big thing in capital is we moved the roof project forward. It was originally on there for FY21, FY22. Given the field stuff that we learned about, um, this is actually a good time to try to get maybe one of the bigger projects approved now so that they're not coming up at the same exact time. Um, so we moved the roof forward to FY20. Um, it is 25 years old. We just had leaks um, last week, this week? Uh, Thursday. Thursday. Um, in computer labs and classrooms and libraries, new leaks that we didn't, aren't the same ones that we patched. So the patching worked, <laughs> but we have new leaks that are popping up. Um, so it is, it is still a need. Um, and you'll be considering the SOI later tonight. Um, so right now, the, all the projections are assuming no MSBA funds, but obviously that would have a big impact if we got MSBA funds. Um, the capital plan has been updated. I've sent it to Rupert to start digging into, um, uh, the new facility director to start digging into. Um, we just heard from JCJ about studying the high school and middle school buildings that could have a future impact on the capital plan. Um, I'll show you the debt assessments in a little bit. They're going to be pretty stable over the next couple of years for town. So the debt assessment is a separate assessment outside of the operating budget that the uh, four member towns have to consider and approve. Um, it's going to be stable until the roof project and then it'll go up a little bit. Um, and the full capital plan will be available tomorrow morning on the website. Um, the link, I tried to use the Google link condenser. I think they stopped doing it. 
So you'll just have to copy and paste that link. I don't recommend typing it. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's what the Google, when, oh, they're on Google Drive, so the links are all kind of crazy like that. If I can just add to the Capitol, uh, one of the things as a follow-up to last week's presentation is we'll be continuing to work with uh, KMA on the accessibility audit and prioritization. Mm -hmm. so that's not yet on the Capitol plan because we need to, time to work with them. Um, so that'll be an update at a right. future meeting. But I, I don't want to, it's not on there, and I, I don't want anyone to think like, oh, why do we have that presentation? It's not being included. It's just we're not at the place yet in, in our work with them where we have that prioritization and then can build that into the Capitol plan. Yeah, right. Um, capital and debt, so this is a sp the specific project. Um, thank you, Mr. Demling, for pointing out a typo that's in your packets. Um, instead of saying middle school roof, it says high school, middle school building study, because that was last year's project. Um, so I fixed it here, but in your uh, packets, it still has the wrong thing. Uh, just in terms of future capital planning, so field improvements, I put a wide range, because we really don't know what the outcome of that, stuff, that piece is going to be. There's the preferred option, but there's other options you know, less, more expensive, so um, put a wide range there. Um, the high school roof, um, it's not much younger than the middle school roof. Um, it's It wasn't on the capital plan before. I put a placeholder there, um, not in terms of a dollar amount, but I created a spot for it and highlighted it. Um, it's something we're gonna have to look at. It's probably five to 10 years away, but that's, we have a 10 year capital plan, it'll be a big ticket item as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's an older part of the roof and a, a newer part of the roof, so it's the older part of the roof that um, we'll have to start thinking about in the next mm -hmm. five to 10 years. Um, and then all the parking lots, um, they're not in terrible shape, but there's just parts of, you've probably seen of all the parking lots at the middle school, where the parent pickup is, and then the back corner of the high school that are in pretty rough shape, um, that we'll need to do something eventually for safety and <laughs> um, walking and things like that. Yes. Uh, in Mr. Sullivan's honor, since he's not here, I'll just say, I think he would say, it'd be great if they were fixed. <laughs> Am I wrong? I think he said that before. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So, he's right. Here's and Mr. Sullivan. Hope he's doing all right. And we'll work, we're going to try to work with the town of Amherst too to um, do some patching this spring to get them in better shape, but mm -hmm. that only lasts so long. So these, this is the capital and debt. Um, different pieces, so FY13 and 15, which is bonded, the FY16 to 19, which is a, a bond anticipation note, smaller projects, so we're just paying that off, and then the projected debt from the roof if we do that. There you go. Uh, me. <laughs> um, and then the assessments below, so the total assessment this year was 369,177, split up among the towns. Um, next year will be 382, 378 the year after, um, rough, and those are estimates, but that should be ballpark. Um, and then the 583 would be the, the high year if the roof went into effect, um, what the towns would pay. You've seen this chart, it's good news. We'll update it um, again when all the FY19 info's in. Um, OPEB, it's late, but we are talking about OPEB late, uh, later. Um, OPEB, we actually had a decrease in our OPEB liability, which is sort of exciting, um, kind of. The, the change in our health insurance uh, model from self-insured to the um, to Maya, having all the shift from PPOs to HMOs, actually decreased our liability for OPEB by that was the main piece, decreased by about seven million dollars. Um, so our liability, closer to eight. Yeah, closer mm -hmm. to eight. So that wasn't the main, the whole tr reason for the change, but that was the bit one of the bigger pieces was that shift. Um, so we haven't seen that go down before, so that's exciting. Um, any questions on the budget? Sure, I have three. One is very tiny. Um, I noticed my tiny question. I'll ask first. Two thousand dollars for school committee supplies. What was that I for? That yeah. Uh, what was that on the ads and cuts? <laughs> no, it was additions right. and reductions. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. That's okay if I say that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things we're trying to we're adding to the budget is um, supplies. Might be contracted services for um, LPAC, the new ELL Parent Advisory Committee, um, which that's new this year. So there's no line item for it. Um, but it's technically, I think, a subcommittee of the school committee, so that's sort of where it exists. Um, and we'd also try to equalize the CPAC budget line at the same time to make those sort of in line with each other. Um, so that would be increases to those line items. Um, we don't know exactly what the expenses will be, but like CPAC does a lot of parent nights um, right. and things like that. Um, so my bigger sort of picture questions. Um, so one is, it's, it's so great to see the, the positive outcome of the health insurance self-insured trust fund crisis that caused such calamity for such a long time. And um, I know that, you know, there, there must have been countless hours that different people in the town and the schools worked on that, and, and they got a lot of grief for a long period of time. <coughs> it would be great, now that this has such a positive outcome, just to give a public thanks or a shout-out to the, who the, whoever those 
unsung heroes are, it'd be great if you or Dr. Morris knew them to mm -hmm. like sing their praises a little bit. Sure. Um, just because, I mean, it's had such a dramatic turnaround mm -hmm. um, and such a positive impact to school services. It would be great to just sort of acknowledge that effort. Um, so that was one. My, my other sort of big picture question is looking at the, the, the decrease um, across the grades and across um, charter choice and vocation. Um, and I, mean, I know I talk a lot about charter schools, but it is interesting to see the decrease across all those dimensions. And uh, it's a complicated thing, you know, we don't, it's parent decision and whatnot. I just didn't know, if, uh, maybe, maybe Dr. Morris had some big picture thoughts about what, what is sort of driving this. Mm -hmm. Because we spend so much time laser focused on little tactical decisions that can move the needle somewhat. And then so when we see big movements like this, it's, it's an opportunity to sort of take a step back and say, okay, well, well, what's going on positively here? Yeah. So I think a couple things. I think, um, right, and, and it's hard to really quantify the return on investment of these things, but I do think that having stability in the committee um, and the administrative team has made a large impact. Um, that's something I hear when I go into communities, particularly Shoots Bay and Leverett, which I'll get to in a second on a different note, is, is uh, if you're not part of the district on the front end, all you're hearing is what you read in the newspaper and what people are talking about. So uh, I think we've had points of time in the district where there were questions, um, and, I, and I'm talking long history. I'm not talking about just last five, six years. I'm talking well beyond that. I think I referenced that when we did the charter choice mm -hmm. um, and private school survey that there was, it was like reading the oral history of, uh, for families who left the district of major uh, points of controversy in the district, and not that we haven't had any, but I do think um, the stability that the committee's offered, uh, and, I'm not, and I'm not, this is, I don't, it sounds strange to say, but it, it's just true, has, has really contributed to people feeling comfortable and confident that the district's headed in a, in a positive direction. So I, I think that's a part of it. I think building stronger relationships with Shoots, Bear, and Leverett, I think Mr. Sullivan, if he was here, would, would speak to that and speak to um, the community of Shootsbury and how, uh, for some students coming to the middle school, there's a preordained two-year stop on a route to another site for high school. And I think through his work and our work, making stronger connections with those communities, it's really helped us uh, meet and uh, share information about our 7 through 12 district that wasn't necessarily apparent. And I think, you know, all the evidence would suggest if you go to seventh grade assuming that you're only going to be in this district for two years, for many people, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that, that that plays out. Um, so I think that's a part of it. I also think we've been trying, um, and I think there's more room to grow to communicate the good successes that we've had in this, in at our celebrate the successes of our staff, um, our parent community, and I think those things matter, right? So I, you know, we were singing the praises of Jody and his folks at Amherst Media. Uh, those videos get a lot of viewing, right? I was joking with the student today. She's like, oh yeah, you know, uh, I know a lot of people watch those. And I'm like, really? You know, like, because sometimes it's, it's exciting to me. I don't know how exciting it is to the general populace, but I think what we're finding is that um, sharing the good work that our staff have been doing for a great many years, but just the fact that we're sharing it more consistently and communicating more readily uh, has an impact of people's excitement and interest in staying within our district. So that's just off the top of my head, the ideas that, that I hear from families as they come in to chat with me about their decisions. Great. So I'd love to go around the table, see if anyone has any other questions. Otherwise, we'll continue rolling forward in our inexorable journey toward the next item. Manino, no questions. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to declare if you don't have a question. I'm just going to go around the table. Is it Um, No, thank you. Very thorough. Okay. Just a tiny one. It's actually related to an earlier comment about the school committee line item and the two thousand um, dollars. Does it has to? Does it have to be called school committee, or could be named something different? <laughs> so, well, and the reason why I yeah. say this is because when you know these become public documents, mm -hmm. people look at this information, and if it looks like there's something here, mm -hmm. and and there's no explanation, they're not sitting yeah. in this meeting. They don't know what that means, right? right? And so you know, it is a little bit. And by the way, not to sound funny about it. But they see iPads being hanged out. Yeah, exactly. That's what the 2000 was. They hear jokes about broken gavels being replaced. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, dude, if those aren't the expenses, then right. let's talk about what the expenses yeah. are. So, so the next version, it'll be spelled out what it is. Um, the reason why it says school committee is because it, it's where it exists in our chart of accounts. Um, so that's sort of the, the department. But, um, but it will be spelled out what it is specifically in the next version that gets sent out. But I think I, I get the larger point where, particularly as it relates to school committee as opposed to central office or curriculum or middle school, high school, like places where people expect there to be budget increases and decreases, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think one thing that we can think through is um, 
just being more clear on that particular sure. one, and it's a small dollar amount that I, I don't think the cat being out of the bag, I don't think we're going to get a lot of pushback about CPAC and LPAC. No, I don't, <laughs> think, I get, I don't think I'll get any so, repeat. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's a point well taken. Yep. And, and just to follow up, I think that, you know, we've had these conversations before, you know, the, the budget document becomes uh, a, an extremely important piece of the work that we do here on the school okay. committee. And it also becomes how people understand the policy of the district, right? And how, you know, the, the work that, that is going on here. So uh, being very careful about how we organize information sure. there. And, you know, and I'm not trying to be nitpicky. I mean, I just, yeah, no, you know, it's, it's a, a, just an example yeah. of something that allows us to be able to, to draw better clarity sure. you know, moving forward. But otherwise, I think this is very well presented. Um, I'm really excited about, you know, some of the, the positive gains that we've made yeah. with this, this mm -hmm. uh, budget. Um, and looking forward to more details. Okay. Ms. Thanks, Steph. I don't have any questions right now. Thank okay, you. great. Rural aid grant sure. vote. So uh, late after the budget was passed last year, I think this was with, and I'll turn to Ms. Rangano if he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but this is with some of the surplus funds in last year's budget. There was a rural aid amount. I think this was shared at a meeting mm -hmm. earlier in the fall, and mm -hmm. the um, folks who deal with uh, giving us funds uh, requested that the school committee actually make a formal vote to accept the rural aid grant um, because it's not necessarily a recurring income source. Actually, it's not in yeah. the governor's budget. Um, so they would like uh, school committees to accept the rural aid grant that was offered to us. So that is in the uh, gifts. Yeah, Locked it's on the gift sheet. Yeah. So we wanted to point it out because it, it feels a little distinct from what's typically in the gifts. Right. And we thought it would be a different vote would be more appropriate. That makes sense. So I guess the question I have is, first off, does anyone have it on the committee have any further questions about this item? Mr. I think it was Senator Alan Vega, Aaron Vega, who spearheaded this effort to get the rural aid line item, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he's a local senator who's, who's also, also done a great amount of work on regional transportation mm -hmm. reimbursement. and. He's, he's one of the strongest vocal advocates okay. on Beacon Hill for Western Mass issues. Um, so, you know, thank you to uh, <laughs> to him and his office and his efforts. I think just, uh, I think it's Adam Hind, I believe. Senator oh, Hind. Senator Senator Rogers. Rogers. I'm sorry, I might be yeah, yeah. Yeah. Representative Vegas from Holyoke. He's yeah. a oh, representative. Right, yeah. I believe he was the Also a great guy. Yeah, <laughs> okay. um, person who, my understanding, and, and I've been in meetings with him, and he was at some of the rural conferences that, for other reasons, some people on, on this committee were at. I think he was the one who really um, advocated. I'm sure there were other people who were involved, but I know he pushed hard for this. I think that sounds right. Yeah. Uh, I'd entertain a motion for the lower item on this sheet. Is it nice? I move to accept the grant from uh, uh, from Dusty to support the FY19 Rural School Aid. First payment received $21,304, regional collaboration, consolidation, and other efficiencies for a total of $42,609. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Carries unanimously um, five to nothing. What? Right? You had your hand up, right? Okay. So you just had a look on your face like I did something. Uh, okay. MSBA vote for arms roof. Sure. Um, so we put together an SOI um, based on a few different pieces of information. We took the last SOI that was submitted for this uh, for the middle school building, which replaced the windows and the doors. Um, we used that as a starting point. Um, we had our facility team look at that and update it um, and sort of package it uh, for a different program for the roof. Um, and so that's what you have as sort of a um, the base from last time updated for new information. Um, we've had some new upgrades to the building that have changed some of the old information. Um, and so, yeah, this was what we would submit. If you have any questions, um, it just goes over the systems of the building, you know, where the deficiencies are, which... Um, in this case, it's the roof and the leaks that um, it's having and the impact that's having on education, which it's not a direct impact, but when you have to, like, move kids out of the way so that they don't get leaked on, it, it's not ideal. Um, and it has had equipment damage. We've had some computers get leaked on. That um, is obviously not what you'd want as well. Um, and we did do some patching, but there's new leaks that are forming. So it's just a, 
it's a roof that seems like it's getting close to time to replace. Great. Are there questions? Is there I just had a couple of clarifying questions. So I noticed um, in on page seven of the application, under beginning on page seven, where it says roof section A, and then it goes on to have different roof sections. Mm -hmm. um, it alternates between is the district seeking replacement of this roof section? Right. For yes, and then indicated no. Yeah. Can you just explain what the different sections are? Yeah. I don't see a table or anything that corresponds with that. So the it's same thing for the window sections too. Yeah, the windows. I don't know how we would do that, but the, for the roof, um, it's sort of, if you look at your layout that you got from the JCJ, the educational wing, that was A, so we are looking to replace that section of the roof. That's sort of the, the main problem area. Um, section B is above the auditorium. That is actually a little newer, and that has not been an issue. That has quite a bit of slope, um, so that we would not be looking to replace right away. It would be maybe down the road, but it's not an urgent issue in any way. There's, there have been leaks there. Um, and then C is over the gymnasium, the pool, and we actually did start to have some leaks um, this most on Thursday. We had some leaks in our gym, and so that is the section we would be looking. So um, it's C and A, to the majority of the roof we'd be looking to replace, but not the middle uh, section. Just a quick yeah. follow-up. So, um, so just to, to understand, so you indicate no for section B, but then you don't say anything for section <laughs> D, E, and the other ones. Is there a technical requirement that you have to? So those are just pre-populated. Um, in the, the SOI program. So there is no DE. Yeah, I think they provide an, I mean, it's my first time, so <laughs> I'll be honest. Me too. Um, <laughs> the, they seem to be pre-populated in there so that they give you sufficient number of um, sections to fill out, because um, your roof could have different Got pieces. Um, so I made sense to do it sort of A, B, and C, because the three different sort of structures. Um, but yeah, that's why there's so many there. And for okay. windows, I just treat it as one whole, because we're not looking to replace the windows, and they're fairly new. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Kessenson? That was or? my question. Okay. Dr. Morris? No, I'm sorry. I thought you had your hand up. Just. You didn't? I'm okay, never mind. No, it's all right. Uh, I guess one question I have is uh, I think I, you answered this previously that if the. that there's nothing in here that would prohibit the district at a future <coughs> point in this project from considering uh, supporting the roof to do. Um, Solar panels? No. Okay. Just wanted to double check that because I didn't see anything in there. I spoke to that. Okay. Are there additional questions that uh, members of the committee have? There is a interesting looking block here that says form of vote. Please use text below to prepare your city, town, or district's required vote. And this looks an awful lot like what you'd like us to vote on. Yeah. Really to be so inclined, right? Yep. Okay, so who who has is uh, feeling well rested and I don't know hydrated to read the text? Can I ask one question? Yeah, sure. Um, so you all have voted on statement of interest before. The one piece of this I just wanted to clarify before you vote. Yes, is where it says the statement of interest form dated January twenty fifth. So I put the date um, that I believe <coughs> sort of the last date that was worked on, um, but I just want to confirm if you think that's the appropriate date. Or if that day should be changed to the submission date, I think it's the 12th. Uh, what day we actually submit, I'm not sure, but um, the version that you're looking at was from the 25th. Uh, Dr. Morris, what do you think? I think if there are no changes to the text of the document, then that, that date it should stay. I think if there were minor changes that were made tonight, then we'd want to update that with you know tomorrow's date to okay. assume yeah. that the changes were made. Okay. Uh, I didn't hear any minor updates. Made, but I think that's no, I mean, I think it's also more of a clerical thing. I mean, yeah. Yeah. one, I'm happy to stick with it as it is. If you, on the other hand, said would have the same date on it, I sure. wouldn't care either, yeah. right? Um, so, okay, so we'll stick, we can stick with it as it mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. uh, who would like to be recognized? Yes, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> no one else is going to be in it. So, just read exactly what's on here, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I move to uh, having convened at an open meeting on January 29th, 2019, prior to the SOI submission closing date, the school committee of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize a superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated January 25th, 2019, for the Amherst Regional Middle School located at 170 Chestnut Street, Amherst, Massachusetts, 01002, which describes and explains the following deficiencies in the priority categories 
for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future replacement of the roof, which has been failing at a higher rate in recent years, and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits a city, town, regional school district to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there further comment or question or discussion about the, <coughs> the motion or the topic? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion as read signify raise their hand. It carries unanimously six to zero. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Uh, open. This isn't even last. I could say last but not least, but it's not last. It's pretty much it. I mean, you got gifts, but that's right. Um, so last time uh, we met, presented the revised OBEB, OPEB trust agreement um, mm -hmm. that the attorneys had looked at and, and made some suggestions. Um, the, there was one big question, which was of the suggestions that uh, the attorneys made, are they driven by law, are they driven by something else? And so I did reach out to Alan Falk from Merrick O'Connell, who's the primary uh, person who worked on this document. Um, and he confirmed that they were all made by, driven by statute. Um, in particular, the question about the two thirds um, he provided the, the reference, I looked it up, so that is driven by the statute in terms of the two-thirds vote to appropriate funds out of the OPEB trust. Right. Are there further questions about this trust fund document? Uh, seeing none, and attending a motion to approve Amherst Pelham Regional School District other post-employment benefits liability trust fund. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Menino. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by raising your hand. Carries six to nothing in favor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is this snowing, by the way? Uh, I can't tell. Yeah, so. yeah. There's no flake. Yeah, just, just, you said something about a text message earlier or something, so I was yeah. curious. I think, yes. I understand that it is snowing, but not terrible on the roads today. Oh, well, wonderful. <laughs> uh, okay, accept gifts. Um, anyone want to volunteer? Ms. McDonald. I move to accept the following gifts from Anonymous Your Cause, number 56016728847, for the middle school at the principal's discretion in the amount of $250. From Florence Bank, number 199993, um, to support 2019 Florence Bank Scholarship in the amount of $500. And from Khalid Alkali, Kathleen Trapagan, number 2263, to support student activities donation for African Scholars Exchange students from Gambia in a total of $1,500, for a grand total of $2,250. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Is there any question or discussions, comments? Yes. Just very briefly that, you know, Kathleen Trapagan is a former member of the Emerson Regional School Committee, so I want to acknowledge that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Just curious as to what that, that is, that program, the exchange students? So we have, um, we have an exchange program from students from the Gambia, so um, I'm trying to think if it's every other year, but that our students um, do have the opportunity to go, and the fundraising is a big component to it, and it's a barrier for many families. It's not inexpensive as one might imagine. There's no external funding source that supports it. So we're deeply appreciative that that makes the trip that much more accessible for students at our high school. Great. All those in favor of the motion to accept these gifts signify by raising your hand. Carries unanimously six to zero. Um, I want to do one thing first before we start looking like we're moving around. Here are some warrants have not been circulating and needs to be signed. I have my homework here, Mr. Mangana. Uh, so we moved off some items for tonight. Want to go? Let's want to talk about next meeting. Sure. Next so two meetings. We'll start uh, a pretty comprehensive math review that we've talked about earlier. So the consultant will be coming to present uh, her findings, and we'll also do. Um, we'll weave in some of our thoughts about 
the recommendations that she's made at the meeting just because some of them are quite timely and we don't want to just the way the schedule works it's a month before we meet again because of February break and other things so the math um, we will have a budget hearing as Mr. Rangano mentioned um, so those will both be pretty thick documents that we receive in advance um, we'll try to get them as, in as much to you in advance as possible um, school choice vote um, fee vote uh, strategic planning update funding vote potentially for seats at the middle school auditorium renovation or repair of seats at the middle school high school auditorium we we'll some policies to bring back, high school principal search, SETF uh, update, and hopefully we can squeeze in, I'd like to do at least a brief mid-cycle update, um, looking back at the goals and, and my perception of where we are with where I am and where the district is with the goals. So, ambitious agenda. Right. So are there other items that were not captured there that people would like to bring up at this moment for future meetings? I'd like to reinforce Mr. Sullivan's request at last meeting that the homework policy for the middle school and the high school high school be reviewed. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Conley. Um Does not have to be uh, next meeting or the next two meetings, given the agenda that you just articulated, but I'll just uh, politely remind about uh, later start times, starting, starting that conversation at some point. Right. Uh, and uh, vaping prevention. Right. Terrific. Uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, raise your hand. Carries six to nothing unanimously. Thank you. Thank you again to Immersed Media. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. 16 minutes behind. That's not too bad.